Hello, this is lecture five of communication systems ENGI 28779. Uh, this is my last lecture for this course. Uh, the lecture six will be with other uh, instructors that you will have. So in this lecture, we will cover signal processing filters. Filters is a big field. We will only highlight key filters in some of the outcomes of filters. We will talk about electronic oscillators. We will discuss frequency mixers. Uh, we'll talk about audio communications and how it means uh, how we can um, uh, take an audio signal and process the audio signal and eventually uh, transmit the audio signal. And this is usually relevant anytime we use um, speech and we use uh, radio communication and we use uh, telephony. So this is where uh, audio communications become uh, critical. Uh, we will specifically link audio communication to, to different type of, uh, of modulations, uh, but most notably to, to AM and FM uh, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. And that should uh, wrap up uh, this lecture. Um, I have to give, mention that we will not cover FM fully. Uh, we will just highlight some of these, both of these technologies, and we will explain AM and FM in a more generic way, in such a way that it is not only relevant for analog communication, but it has a lot of uh, relevance to uh, digital communications, things that you will see from lecture six onward. Okay, let's begin. Before we begin into the topic of this lecture, there was one tiny uh, uh, subject that we covered uh, in previous lectures, in lecture three and in lecture four, but I didn't really have a dedicated uh, things to display to you on, on a slide. So, so now I have this slide and, and I will show it to you. So essentially what I wanted to, to, to convey to you is that if we do have a signal in the time domain and the signal is periodic, Right? So you have a periodic signal, and we saw this, right? The square wave signal uh, is periodic, the sawtooth, the triangle, these were all periodic, right? It has a certain period, and it repeats after, a, uh, after with the same period of T naught. If it is periodic, in the frequency domain, what you get is a bunch of uh, spikes or a bunch of stems, these discrete points, at discrete frequencies, and they are all multiples of the fundamental frequency, and the fundamental frequency, you could get it from the time domain. Basically, it's one over F naught, uh, one over T naught, and that gives you F naught. So this is the first fundamental frequency, and these are multiples of the, of the fundamental frequency, whether odd, even, or all of them. It depends on the shape of your, of your, of your signal. Uh, at the end of the day, what is important to realize is that if you have a periodic signal, you will get spikes and spikes. So that's that's that. If you have a non-periodic signal, such a such a thing, you won't have a spike. You will have a continuous smooth figure in the frequency domain. And why is this? Well, one way to view this is as though um, a, a um, non-periodic signal is kind of similar to a periodic signal, except here the period is infinity, right? And notice this, whenever the period goes up, whenever the period is large, we have a large period, so this here the period is this to this, here the period is from here to here, the spikes become narrower, they become closer to each other. Right? The frequency of this one and the frequency of this one, they become very close to each other whenever this is large. So they are inversely proportional. Right? Um, so whenever the period goes large, the spikes between them, they become closer to each other. Here the, the, the period is smaller, the, 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 the spikes are more spread out. Okay? So if you have an extremely large period, let's, let's say a period of infinity, Right? So, in other words, it's a non-periodic signal. It's non-periodic. It doesn't have a, a specific pattern that is repeated. Then the spikes are so close to each other that it becomes a continuous and smooth figure like this one here. Okay? So, this is what I want you to, to realize, is that if we have a continuous time signal, continuous time signal, and it is periodic with a certain T naught, to move into the frequency domain, uh, we have to use Fourier series, right? To go from here to here, we have to use Fourier series. And the result that you get in the Fourier domain are spikes, 
which you see in the spectrum analyzer, there's a bunch of uh, spikes or a bunch of stems that, that are pointing, right? Uh, not necessarily like this, they will have a bell shape uh, to it, but nonetheless, this is how it would look like, spikes. Whenever you have a continuous time signal, like this one here, but it is aperiodic, there is no specific pattern that is repeated to it, or you could think of it as though the period is equal to infinity, you will go to the frequency domain, and in the frequency domain, it's not a spikes that you see, it's an actual continuous plot, a continuous figure. Okay, uh, and that's that's through the logic that I just explained, continuous figure. And how do we go from this to frequency domain? We use Fourier transform, Fourier transform. How do we go from this to this or from this to this? We use Fourier series. So just, just realize that. If we go from this to this, we use Fourier uh, series. If from this to this, Fourier series, from this to this, we use Fourier transform. We didn't cover Fourier transform fully, but that's the function that you use. Okay? And, and that's about it. And a good way to understand this is to, by viewing it as though this is a periodic signal, but the period is goes to infinity. Now, in terms of the, uh, the shape of how it will look like, it's like this. So if I give you the frequency domain this, and I give you the frequency domain this, and I ask you, is this... Does this come from a uh, from a periodic signal or a non-periodic signal? Well, because you see stems or because you see spikes right, or discrete points, you know right away that it comes from a periodic signal, such as, such as this or this. What about this? You know right away that it comes from something that looks like this in the time domain, but this the the, the shape is non-periodic, right? It's non-periodic. There's just one of them. There's no multiple copies of it. And that's why it becomes smooth like this, connected. There's no disconnect, disconnectivity between them. There's no discrete points, highly connected. Now, in terms of the bandwidth, well, the bandwidth won't change much, right? <clears throat> Sorry. The bandwidth, we said, the bandwidth of an information signal is the difference between the highest, this one here, the highest, right? This is five uh, kilohertz, and this is the lowest. This is one kilohertz. And you take the difference, five, th five kilohertz minus one kilohertz, that's equal to four kilohertz. Okay, and the same thing here, highest minus the lowest, and that's the bandwidth. So bandwidth does not change, okay? That's, that's, that's the key thing that I, we did mention it, but I didn't have a dedicated slide. Now I wanted to show it to you. So now that this is out of the way, let's, can, let's actually begin the lecture with, uh, with mixers. Okay, let's go. The first topic that I'd like to discuss in this lecture is uh, filters. Uh, so the more, I guess, appropriate way of referring to filters, because there are so many filters in, in, in life, is signal processing filters. Filters that uh, are used in signal processing, which means what it, mean, what, what it is is that we have a signal and then we're trying to somehow modify the signal, and that's what processing is. You're processing, you're changing, you're modifying, you're adjusting the signal, and that's what the word processing is. Uh, this is a huge field by itself, but we will just cover very briefly some stuff. This is a nice picture that I found on Wikipedia. It shows the different varieties of, of filters. So you have a low pass filter, a high pass filter, a band pass filter, a band stop filter, uh, um, a low band uh, uh, a low band pass, uh, a band high pass, uh, a low uh, band high pass. So there are different type of filters. What it basically means is this. If you have such a thing, it means that it only passes this kind of frequencies that fall here. If it's zero, then it means it doesn't pass those frequencies. So here, anything from here onward doesn't pass it. Anything here, it doesn't pass it. Does not pass, does not pass, only passes here. In a certain band, only passes here. The higher frequencies only passes here. The lower frequencies only passes the, um, uh, it, it essentially passes all the frequencies except certain bands, right? Certain bands. So it's just a, a different varieties of, of filters that you have. So we'll go more in depth in, in it. So uh, that's the first topic. That's why we call it 5.1. Uh, and then we'll move on after this to mixers. Okay, let's get going. Uh, previously, we talked a bit about um, the filters. The filters are these kind of boxes. So you'll see a box like this, and then you'll either see uh, an LPF. Uh, LPF stands for low pass filter. Or you, sometimes you might see BPF. 
BPF stands for band pass filter. So, and then if it's LPF or BPF, usually it tells you the bandwidth. It's LPF, what is the cutoff frequency? It tells you a cutoff frequency. Uh, and if it's a bandpass filter, uh, where is it generally centered or what's the bandwidth of this bandpass filter? I think as the name uh, suggests, it's a filter. Uh, you know, when you have a filter, uh, a filter is like a, a filter of a coffee. You know, when you make your coffee, you, you put a filter. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, it You put in your coffee bits and then you put in water. And so these coffee bits cannot go in. You just get the nice coffee uh, driplets uh, out of it. So it's just... It, it doesn't allow certain items to pass through and it only allows others to go through, right? So it's the same thing here. With a filter, what it means is that certain frequency will be allowed to pass and certain frequency will be simply stopped. It will say, you know, you cannot pass. We don't want to in the output. So you won't see the uh, certain frequencies in the output. And that's the whole point of a filter. So a filter allows the passing of certain uh, frequencies and it uh, and it uh, prevents other frequencies from passing. So let's look at here. So in this case, we have a square wave signal. We saw this, we saw the square wave signal and we saw how to break it down in terms of harmonics in lecture uh, four. We had an extensive lecture on this. And as you saw, the harmonics, they jump in between F naught, 3 F naught, 5 F naught, 7 F naught, 9 F naught, 11 F naught, 13 F naught, and all the way for a long time. And as it, it goes into uh, many harmonics, odd harmonics, the, the power uh, of each spike diminishes. Power diminishes. Power, or if you want, the peak voltage diminishes. Now, if we have a low pass filter, and we specify the low pass filter. So let's say a low pass filter, let's say up to, I don't know, two F naught, which means that it's a box that you put for above your spectrum, right? So this thing is the low pass filter, this thing here, this thing colored, and it only allows this to pass, only allows this one to pass or whatever it's in its bandwidth. So let's say I have a low pass filter that goes all the way to four. If it goes all the way to four, it passes this and this. Let's say I have a low pass filter that it goes all the way to five. If it goes all the way to five, it generally passes this and this. It may also pass five. So you really need to go a bit farther than five to cover it. So if I want to have five covered, I will maybe go until six. Right? That filter that will go into six, it will bring this one, this one, and this one. If my filter goes up to 2.2 to 2 F naught, it will cover this one. If your only, if your filter goes to F naught, it it generally will take this one, but it not fully, right? Because remember what we saw about these spikes in lecture three. These spikes are not just a, a natural spike; they have a curve, right? So they look kind of like this. They have a kind of a curve, and so your filter should also be curvy. It's not just like you know a box that you put in it, the boxes uh, of filters they sometimes are shown in in theory but in real life they don't exist filters they mostly look like this one here where they have a curvy shape also the spikes they have a curvy shape so your your curve should be a bit uh, more so that it really covers the actual spike so let's say if you want to take this spike you cannot just stop at F naught for the filter. You need to go a bit more, maybe until two, maybe until three. So this is a good picture. That gives you a, a good picture. And with this kind of filter, certainly you you know for sure that this one will get out. You will take this one and all the other ones you, will, you won't take, right? So you will reject all the other harmonics. So with a low pass filter that goes, let's say with a cutoff frequency of two F naught, uh, you are taking this one here. So that's good. Uh, here, and this is how it looks like. If you only take one harmonic, well, what do you expect? You will have it only at this frequency, F naught, and that's why it is one uh, kilohertz. Uh, and the other thing that you expect, because the, this is one kilohertz, the frequency here is T naught, uh, uh, F naught, and this is, you're only taking the first harmonic, so it's gonna be the same frequency. And it looks like this because it's only one spike. We said every spike is a sinusoidal, that's why it looks like this. Okay, uh, if you had two spikes, if you had two spikes, uh, if your filter was a bit bigger, you would have taken this one and this one, uh, and your um, result will be an addition of two different 
uh, sinusoidals. And, and we saw example of this. If you only add two sinusoidals, how will your graph look? It will still look like a square wave, but not a perfect square wave. It will have two kind of uh, uh, ripples here. Uh, and so it's not going to be a perfect square wave, but it's going to be somewhat of a square wave. Okay, and the more you put in, the closer you'll be to this one here. So now the, the message of this slide is really to explain what this box is. What's a low pass filter? Sometimes we want a band pass filter, not a low pass filter, a band pass filter. It means it only passes certain bands. So in this case, we say it's a band pass filter around three kilohertz. Okay, so which means is that it will take mostly whatever you have three kilohertz in things around it, very things very closely around it. So in this case, it's just three kilohertz. Uh, and this is how it looks like. And it me what it means is all the other stuff are rejected. All the other stuff are rejected. If I ask you about filters in the midterm, it don't you don't need to consider it like this. You could just put in a box. And generally, I will give you the center frequency of the filter, also the uh, the bandwidth of the filter. So I'll tell you, this filter has a center frequency of 3F0, and it has a bandwidth uh, of, let's say, uh, 2, 2F0. Two well, so how do you measure the bandwidth? From 2 to 4, that's 1F0, that's 2F0, so that's 2F0, and the center frequency of it is at 3F0, okay? So these are things of, to, to explain to you how it is. Okay, uh, so this is a band pass filter. It only takes this one here, the third harmonic, and the first one, the fifth, the seventh, and everything else is rejected. Uh, what do you see in the output from your square wave? Well, you still see a sinusoidal, except now it operates at uh, at this this frequency. Frequency that operates here is at three F naught, and therefore three kilohertz. Uh, so it's three times faster than this. Okay, this is looking at the result of the filter in the uh, in the time domain. This is looking at the filter result of the filter in the time domain. This is what you see in the frequency domain. So this is the frequency domain of this. Uh, one spike that you have here is the frequency domain of this one. One spike that you have here is the frequency domain of this one. So you need to have the eyes to look at it in the block diagram, in time domain, in frequency domain and, uh, and and to see how you overlay the, the filter. So I hope that that makes sense. Okay, on to the next uh, topic. This is kind of an additional slide that also looks into the square wave signal. So you have here your typical square wave and we saw this, the, how we derived this. And in this square wave where, uh, as you see here, only the first of three harmonics are taken. I mean, I mean, Okay, so maybe the way I said it is wrong. Only three harmonics are taken. Three non-zero harmonics are taken. This is the F naught. This is three F naught, and this is five F naught. Okay, uh, and that's why because you have only three harmonics that are taken, you see three spikes. And you know it's a it's a it's an okay approximation. It's not the best, but it's an okay approximation. And so therefore, you're dropping all the other harmonics in order to drop all the other harmonics you will need a low pass filter with bandwidth of 6F0, a bit more than 5F0, right? A bit more, so you go to the one after that until six, and until six, you take that, uh, you take it from zero, to whatever you have. So you could put in a box from zero to 6F0, and whatever shows up there, you take it, which is the first harmonic, the third harmonic, and the fifth harmonic. This is what you get. Now, what if you only go, uh, you do here oh, until the seventh harmonic, so you have four uh, non-zero harmonics, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and this is seven F naught, and therefore you need a bandpass filter up to eight F naught. Uh, and that gets you this, and it drops all the other harmonics. So you need a low pass filter of eight F naught. If you don't have any filter, or if you put a filter of size infinity, well, you take all the harmonics. This is not realistic. It doesn't exist, and this is not possible. So this is just a you know, just a kind of funny looking thing, but it's just there to, to explain to you how the size of the filter impacts the estimation of uh, your uh, your your result from the square wave right how many the if you have a larger filter well the your approximation becomes better but um you know i don't know if this is what you want to do right so so you have to to see what what it means right so larger filters allows you more harmonic more harmonics allows you to give to 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 produce a result that looks um closer to the original signal 
Uh, and the other thing is, if somebody asks you, well, what is the bandwidth of this? Uh, you could you could then say it's seven F naught, right? So that's the bandwidth of the signal. Um, if it if it's a bit larger, sometimes people might say eight F naught, but seven F naught should be the uh, the appropriate answer. So you use a filter of eight F naught to take up to seven. Okay. Uh, and if somebody asks you, what is the bandwidth now of this? You could just say seven F naught, as we saw in lecture four. Okay. So this is just a uh, uh, just a view of low pass filter in connecting it to the previous stuff that we did. This is yet another example. In this example, we are looking at the sawtooth. So this is how a sawtooth looks like, and this is the expansion, the Fourier series expansion of the sawtooth in time domain. We saw this in lecture four. Uh, perhaps the result that you have in lecture four is a bit different. The plus or minus alternates, and that's that's okay. In this figure, the sawtooth is a bit shifted for us. This one here, this center was at the origin, but now in this picture, it's shifted. And if it is shifted, the, the expression will be a bit different. You have to show it, but it's a bit different. Nonetheless, um, if we only show the first harmonic, in other words, we take two V naught over pi times sine omega naught T, uh, this would be it. If we do the second harmonic, it's the same amplitude, except now it's divided by two. So it's whatever this amplitude is. If it's, this is five volt, this is now 2.5 volt. And this is for the second harmonic. This is for the third harmonic. The amplitude of this one is divided by three. This is for the fourth harmonic uh, divided by four. And let's say we stop at four harmonics. This, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and we add them together. This is what you get, right? This kind of line that goes up and down. It's a good approximation to the sawtooth in this period. It's a good approximation. So I would say, like, if you have four, four, the first four harmonics, that gives you a good approximation of the sawtooth. Okay, so now let's look at it from a filter point of view. So if you take filter A, so this is the original one. This is the original sawtooth. We just put it here. But it, now if we only take filter A, where is filter A? Filter A, so you only have a box here. You see it? The box for filter A, it only takes this one here, this harmonic. So in other words, this is what you get. This is this result, right? And so if you look at this and you look at this, they're not quite the same. They're not quite the same, not a good approximation. So this is not a good approximation. If you make your filter a bit bigger, right? So you make your filter a bit bigger, uh, instead of stopping here at let's say 1.5 kilohertz, you bring it up all the way to let's say 4.5 kilohertz. Right? You can put the filter anywhere. The size, the cutoff frequency, the, the place where it stops, this is known as the cutoff frequency of the filter. You could put it anywhere you want. It doesn't have to be at integer values. It's your filter, you design it, you could put it anywhere you want. So let's say you have a filter, this filter B, it goes all the way to somewhere between four and five, which is let's say 4.5 kilohertz here. Uh, and if it comes until 4.5 kilohertz, it will only take whatever is inside it. So it will take the first harmonic, the second, the third, and the fourth. So this, you basically will get this one here, this approximation here. You add all these different terms, and this is what you get. This is a good approximation of the original signal. Uh, let's say you are, you have uh, more resources, and you have a better, more expensive filter. Your filter has a bigger bandwidth. So this is the bandwidth of the filter. This is the bandwidth of the filter. This is the bandwidth of the filter, a bigger bandwidth. Uh, and your filter goes all the way to 100 kilohertz. A bit crazy, but you know, let's say you have that. Okay, and if you have a filter that goes all the way to 100 kilohertz, then that's great. It means you are taking 100 harmonics. This is one, two, three, four. You go all the way to 100 harmonics, and this is what you get. Now, to be honest, this is not quite realistic. It's a huge filter, uh, but sometimes uh, people are able to build such a filter. Uh, and if it is the case, then that's what you get. If you get this, well, you compare it to the original signal, it looks quite good. So if you take the first 100 harmonics, that's a almost perfect uh, uh, match, right? Almost perfect. Uh, so quite good when you take uh, uh, the first 100 harmonics. But don't forget that what we said uh, with harmonics, uh, the more harmonics you take, the better approximation you get of your original signal. But what is not good is that your bandwidth will be big and you do not want a huge bandwidth. A big bandwidth is not something that is recommended, right? So you always want to have uh, a smaller bandwidth. 
right? Smaller bandwidth uh, are, are more realistic to transmit in a communication. And one key reason why we want to do that is in a, to enable more users to access this limited resource, the channel, the wire, whatever the case might be for the um, for your transmission. Okay, so uh, that's that's another example of filters. Now I'm going to show you maybe a, a quick circuitry of low pass filter, and then we wrap up the filter business, and then we move into uh, into mix. Although in, in this course we focus mostly on uh, on uh, system level communications. In other words, we only show you block diagrams of different uh, systems and subunits. In this uh, on this slide, we wanted to quickly show you the circuitry of a low pass filter. A low pass filter can be designed in different ways. And there are a simpler low pass filter. There are more complicated low pass filter. There, this is a huge uh, field by itself. People write books on filters, uh, but here. Uh, I, we wanted to show you the, the low pass filter with only a very basic circuitry. So you have a resistor, you have a capacitor, they're connected in series, and you also have an AC source. And the output of the capacitor, that gives you the result of your filter. So from the, from the V out here to the ground, that, that gives you the, the voltage of the, uh, around the capacitor. And if you look at this in the frequency domain, it would look something like this. Essentially what it means is that it will pass all the frequencies up to a frequency FC. FC, and I mentioned it before, this is known as the cutoff frequency. So anything beyond FC is cut off. You cut it off, you, you don't take it. Anything below FC, on FC and below, you take it. How do you measure FC? The way to measure where FC is, is that you go from the highest value, the highest, uh, uh, amplitude of not the amplitude but the highest power for the low pass filter in the frequency domain you go down by 3 db so this is known as a 3 db uh, cutoff frequency you go down by 3 db whatever you do a line whatever and then you drop it to the uh, to, to this axis to the x-axis the frequency axis this value here this is known as the cutoff frequency so for such a circuit for an rc low pass filter the cutoff frequency is here it's 2 pi rc uh, and yeah, so anything that falls from zero to, to, to the uh, cutoff frequency is taken. Anything beyond that is not taken. Okay, uh, so that's just a simple example of a low pass filter. And again, it, there are many others. Uh, this is just one of them. So as you can see, you could easily build a low pass filter. Okay, let's move on. Okay, now that the filters are done, the next uh, topic that uh, we want to discuss in this lecture is frequency mixers. So mixers are something that you will see in almost uh, all communication systems. Uh, you have a mixer at, at the transmitter and you also have a mixer at the receiver. The whole point of a mixer is that it, as the name goes, it mixes frequencies. Uh, one way to model a mixer is just by a multiplication. Multiplication in the time domain. And that's what a mixer does. And we'll see that uh, when we show you AM. Uh, so in general, a mixer is used when you are, have a low frequency and you want, uh, you're in the baseband. So you, let's say you have your voice and you want to send your voice over a channel. You need to move it into a higher frequency. And so you mix your low frequency with a, a carrier frequency. And the carrier, the carrier signal, if you want, uh, it is uh, done by the local oscillator here that you see here. Uh, the LO, this is what the carrier is. This is uh, the intermediate frequency, or sometimes we simply call it the baseband frequency. Let's say your voice, it could, you could also think about it as though you enter it here. This is your uh, carrier frequency. You mix them together, you multiply them together, and then the result that you get is an RF. Anytime you hear the word RF, it means that it's a higher frequency. So the frequency of this will be certainly higher than this one. It will be around the same frequency as this one. So what will the frequency of this one be? Uh, essentially, it will be either the uh, addition of these two frequencies or the difference of these two frequencies. So depending on how you configure your mixer. A mixer always has three points, uh, three ports. Um, uh, two ports that come in, one port that comes out, uh, and it depends how you configure it. So if you have the L for local oscillator as one of the input, and you have I for the intermediate uh, uh, frequency as another input, then R, the RF frequency, would be your output. In this, in such a configuration, this is used at a transmitter. 
If on the other hand, you have uh, as an input your local oscillator, this, you also have your radio frequency, it comes in. Now, let's say we flip the, the arrow that it comes in. What you get out would be the intermediate frequency. So it depends on how you configure it. If you do it where this is an input and this is an input and this is an output, this is something that you end up using at the receiver. So, so depend on how you configure it. Now, how do you turn on and turn off a mixer? Well, in general, it's with this. The local oscillator is what decides on how to turn on a mixer, turn it off a mixer, and it depends on the voltage of the, uh, of the LO. So if you have a high voltage, the mixer is activated. If you have a low voltage, then it's just the mixer is not working. Okay, so I hope that, uh, that that's kind of a, a quick uh, uh, view here. Now, when we talk about mixers, we will talk about other things around mixers as well. So terminologies that you might end up hearing in communications a lot is up conversion, uh, down conversion, um, and of course, local oscillator, right? So you'll hear that. Um, intermediate frequency is a terminology that you hear. It's it's sometimes it's hard to explain what intermediate frequency is. If you want, for us, we could always think of intermediate frequency as the original signal, the signal your voice, your original baseband signal. Uh, that's we could think about it as intermediate frequencies. Um, in general, intermediate frequency is used when we want to bring something at a lower frequency so that we could process it uh, at the receiver before actually putting it at a speaker or at the at the final destination of the signal. So it's certainly anytime you hear inter IF or intermediate frequency, it means the frequency of it will be less than this one and less than this one. So that's just given to you. And so this is always at the baseband. This is a higher frequency and this will be at the passband, right? So you multiply a low frequency with a high frequency, you end up getting a high frequency. You multiply a high frequency with a high frequency, you end up getting a low frequency. Okay, so we'll see that on the next slide. As we just saw earlier, all frequency mixers will have a, uh, a, an LO, a local oscillator. In fact, you will have a local oscillator in both uh, at the transmitter end and at the receiver. You need to uh, use a local oscillator in order to generate a sinusoidal and the or the sinusoidal that you have this is basically your carrier frequency this is a signal that will carry your your um, small uh, your your low frequency signal message information into uh, the channel and it will essentially carry it and that's why it's called the carrier frequency uh, now, how do you generate a, a, a local oscillator? Well, the way to do it is you simply need a DC supply. You put it into an oscillator and what is comes out of the oscillator is essentially a sinusoidal. And this is a sinusoidal with a certain uh, peak voltage uh, and a certain frequency. The frequency that you get from the oscillator will be generally high because we're using this for uh, as a carrier and uh, you need to carry the signal to very high frequencies. If we're talking about AM uh, signals, it's generally in the kilohertz and in the megahertz. If we're talking about uh, FM signals, it is generally uh, in the megahertz. And if we're talking about wireless technologies, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, Zigbee, um, cell phone, mobile communication, VTX, satellite communication, they will uh, send your signal in the gigahertz. So depending on the application, your uh, the generated um, signal that you get from the oscillator will uh, will be, um, you know, for, for instance, if we talk about RF oscillators, there's somewhere between 100 kilohertz to 100 gigahertz. So it covers all ranges from the AM, the FM, and all the different uh, digital wireless communication technologies. So one thing to realize is that you have an oscillator on both ends, at the transmitter and at the receiver. Uh, you need that, right? So at the transmitter, you need an oscillator because it will carry your, your message signal. And at the receiver, you also need a, an oscillator, not because it is carrying a signal, but because it will help you to decode your message. Uh, so you need an oscillator. Uh, we just saw it earlier on the previous slide, and we'll see it later on on the next slide, where we take uh, the RF signal, we put it, we multiply it with an oscillator, we pass it to, through the mixer, and then the, the result is what gives us the, um, the IF, or if you will, your, our uh, message signal, 
Okay, so this is what I wanted to do, to show you here on this slide. So very quick slide: how how it's generated, where it's used, what are the typical frequencies that you get with an oscillator. Okay, let's get going. So as mentioned before, this is how uh, one would, for instance, visualize the benefit of using a mixer. So if you notice here, in this case, the mixer is used to up convert. In other words, to take a, um, a signal from the baseband. So anytime we talk about baseband, we mean that a signal is around the DC, around the origin here, right? It's around here and we want to move it somewhere it's respectively where it should be on the spectrum, right? At a higher frequency. Uh, in order to move this, you need to take your signal, which is represented by the IF. So this is your message. This is you talking. This is a, a, a signal, a, a radio uh, signal. This is a um, whatever. This is the, the information that we want to convey. And the, the mechanism by which we will use to, uh, to make our signal travel uh, uh, to go to a respective frequency is this, the local oscillator. So the local oscillator essentially is your carrier frequency. Okay, So this is one uh, particular signal. This is another particular signal. In general, the local oscillator, or if you will, the uh, which, which basically is your carrier frequency, it is a sinusoidal. So it's a sinusoidal with a very high frequency, a high frequency, the frequency where we want this to move. And in general, it is sinusoidal, right? But it doesn't have to be. There are some certain cases where uh, the uh, local oscillator is actually a square wave. Uh, but in most of the time, it is a sinusoidal uh, uh, signal. It just happens sometimes it is a square wave. So I think if you assume that it is a sinusoidal, it's a safe choice. Uh, you multiply them together. That's why you have the symbol here, the X. Uh, they are multiplied in the time domain, and what you get, the output, is what goes into the air, okay? So all this actually happens in the transmitter. All this happens in the transmitter, okay? And essentially what happens is you take your signal, the it moves uh, at a certain high frequency, and the power of it is, in fact, a split. It's split. Part of it will be on the left side, Part of it will be on the on the on the positive side. And where does it show up? At which frequency? It shows up at these frequencies. The lower part will show up at the uh, frequency where you take the difference. You take the difference. You take wh whichever you want. May maybe uh, the local oscill the oscillator because it is uh, certainly larger than this minus this, and that's the lower part where that's the center frequency of it. And the other one, the uh, will appear at the addition of these two. That's where the other part of your information signal is. Now it is in the channel, right? Now it is in the channel, and um, uh, that that that's that's where it is located in the channel when we uh, have the signal travel. So you have to move your signal to an upper frequency for it to travel over the air. You have to, otherwise it's not going to go in the proper place. It will interfere, and and so on. So you need to know at which frequency you're allowed to move and then you move it to that specific frequency. So this is a baseband, this is high frequency, and this is passband. This is what happens. And all this is really related to the transmitter. Now, if we wanna look at it at the receiver, so let's say you are at the receiver and you have your signal, uh, this is your signal, and you what you want is you want to, in fact, get it back in the baseband. You want to receive it. You want it uh, on your radio station. You want it on your receiver device. Then what you do is you essentially take your RF signal, you multiply it with the local oscillator. You, you have this local oscillator, the carrier frequency. You should have the carrier frequency at your receiver. You multiply it with the signal that you just got from the air. You multiply it together. And what you get, what you get is the lower frequency. You get this. Right? So this is the down conversion. This happens at the receiver. This happens at the transmitter. So this is your uh, message. This is your carrier frequency. This is what you send in the air. This is what you receive from the air. This is at your receiver. And you multiply both of them. And this is what you get um, to your, let's say, speaker or to whoever you're sending your message to. So this, all this happens at the receiver. Okay, and essentially what you say, what you do is you take the difference, right? You take the difference 
of the local oscillator, which is a high frequency, minus this, and then you, you do absolute value. You don't need the absolute value. You know for sure it's going to be um, uh, positive, uh, but sometimes if you take the other lobe, uh, then maybe it becomes negative, so you want to make sure that it is a positive value. At the end of the day, you just take a difference of these two, this one and this one, and then you make sure that it's a positive value, and that's where your frequency is. If we are, if our message is is a sinusoidal, then in the bay in the base band is just a spike, and in the pass band it's a spike, but the height is divided by two. It's divided by two. Uh, if your message is not a sinusoidal, it is not a periodic. It is an aperiodic signal. In the base band is just a curve. Let's say this one here. Uh, in the pass band, it's the same kind of curve, same shape, except the height of it is split in half. It becomes like this. Okay, and that's that's that. So I think that kind of gives you a sense of what up conversion, down conversion is, uh, and uh, and it's a good uh, way to 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 see how it is used at the transmitter uh, and at the receiver. Okay, uh, and and this is basically how it works, right? Like we mentioned earlier, a mixer is always a device with two inputs, one output. You, the local oscillator is always one of the inputs. Whether you're, are, you have it at the transmitter or at the receiver, local oscillator is your carrier frequency. It's always one of the inputs. The other one is either your message or the signal that you receive. Okay. So, and this is also true for both analog and digital communication. Let's move on to the next slide. This figure is kind of redundant to what we just saw earlier on the previous slide, but I still wanted to show it to you because in here you could certainly see the impact on the frequency domain, although the other one did also show the frequency domain. But now you have terminologies like baseband and passband. So at the transmitter, what you have is you have your message, your information signal, and uh, we're looking at it in the frequency domain, right? So this is F, a frequency, and this is here we're showing amplitude, but this could also be power. And you have this kind of shape, let's say, in the frequency domain. Now, if you look at it, it's not a spike, and we generally see spikes, right? So remember we said spikes uh, or stems are things that you see in the frequency domain if you are dealing with a uh, periodic signal. But if you have an aperiodic signal, a non-periodic signal, you won't necessarily see uh, spikes or stems. You will see a, um, a smooth and continuous uh, uh, figure. And this is a smooth and continuous figure. And, and what this lets us to believe is that the signal that this represents in time domain is an aperiodic signal. It's not a periodic signal. This is what we have. It has a certain a bandwidth, a bandwidth of W. A negative uh, bandwidth is not measured, just W. And this is in the baseband. So this is, let's say, your, your information signal that you want to send. Now that you send it, you send it to the, uh, uh, to the frequency, you'll end up getting in the passband something that looks like this. So it has a certain carrier frequency. This is the frequency of the LO, carrier frequency. And it will go, um, uh, it, the, the length of it will be between FC plus W and FC minus W, the, the bandwidth from whatever you are, you go by it by W and you go below it by W. So if you measure the bandwidth, the pass band bandwidth is two times the base band bandwidth. So if I ask you, what is the bandwidth of this? And we said, when you want to look at the bandwidth of a signal, you always have to look at it in the frequency domain. So here we are using Fourier transform. We look at the bandwidth, the bandwidth is W. Here we look at the uh, uh, we again use a Fourier transform and we look at the uh, bandwidth and the bandwidth is 2W. From here, FC plus W minus, uh, you open a bracket, FC minus W and that gives you 2W, right? And that's the bandwidth in the passband. So it's always like this. Um, now that you have your signal in the passband, so this is done at the transmitter, you, you generate your signal, somebody speaking, your video, your message, whatever it is, uh, you put it in the channel and then at the receiver, what we do is we take it from the passband and we bring it back to the baseband. Okay, we bring it back to the baseband. So this thing here is referred to as up conversion and this is referred to as down conversion. Uh, except here, the, the picture is really done for a periodic signal. Um, we also had this on the previous slide. In the previous slide, we had both for periodic signal where it was a stem and we had for aperiodic signal. The only difference is that 
we drew it with with this kind of smooth figure here it looks like a triangle shape okay uh, so that's another way of looking at it to be honest this figure is quite redundant but i still wanted to show it to you so you get a sense of it the key thing to, to recall is how you go from baseband to passband and how you go from passband to baseband uh, at the transmitter at the receiver during up conversion during down conversion and also the amplitude of your uh, spectrum, the amplitude of where the spectrum appears is half. So let's say this is, I don't know, some, I don't know, so five volts, then this one will be 2.5 volts, and this one here will be also 2.5 volts. So this is something that you should know. Okay. Okay, so finally we're in the last uh, stretch of this lecture, which is the, uh, the third part. And in here we will talk about, um, as the title goes, with amplitude modulation. So we will kind of give you a quick overview of AM, although we did talk about it in previous lectures, but we'll give you a quick overview of AM, how AM signal is formed. So we'll see how this is done. Uh, we'll show you some some equations, not too much, but uh, mostly um, we'll, we'll show you the graphics of how the AM signal appears in the AM and also, uh, uh, sorry, how AM signals appears in the time domain and also in the frequency domain. Um, we will also talk about uh, a special index that is uh, used with AM modulation, and it, it is known as the modulation index. Uh, it has a certain uh, meaning uh, for AM. Uh, it is used to know if you have, if you are doing your modulation properly, or if you are over modulating, and if you are over modulating, what are the impacts of that, um, and how can you recover your signal? Sometimes you cannot, but we'll see that uh, when we talk about the index. We will also discuss uh, the power of AM signals, and we will also see very quickly different ways of modulating AM with double sideband or single sideband modulation. So there's two different ways of doing the same thing. They're very, they're almost the same, except one and you just filter a part of it as opposed to the other. So we'll see that um, very briefly as well. Uh, finally, we will talk about how the AM signal is detected. How do you receive an AM signal? And, uh, and also very briefly on the impact of noise. And that should wrap it up. Okay. This slide is really a refresher of uh, modulation because we certainly did talk about modulation uh, in earlier lecture, but very uh, uh, briefly. So what is modulation? So the the signal that you will have in the uh, in the baseband, the the source of your signal, the message, sometimes it's called the intelligence that you're trying to send. This signal that you have, this source of signal that you have, audio, computer data, whatever it is. In this case, it's an audio signal. This usually operates. In fact, it it generally operates in the baseband, so it it means it operates in low frequency. And low frequency signals cannot travel far, right? So you cannot bring them far. What you need to do is you need to attach a low frequency signal to a signal with a high frequency. And that's why we use an oscillator. An oscillator will generate another signal. It will generate basically a sinusoidal with a higher frequency, certainly higher frequency than this one. So you take the signal, you look at it in the, um, let's say, if your signal is aperiodic, which we assume it is aperiodic, you look at it in the frequency domain using Fourier transform, and you take the, the bandwidth of it. This uh, frequency is certainly the operating frequency of this, the carrier frequency uh, from the oscillator that is generated from the oscillator here will be certainly way, way bigger than the bandwidth, the baseband bandwidth of your message signal. Uh, and that's that's just and that's what we wanted, right? We wanted something to to be at a higher frequency. So then you take this and you attach it to this. You embed it with the carrier signal. The carrier signal will then carry your signal across the channel. Uh, how do you do all that? Well, you do it at the receipt at the transmitter, and you use a device called a mixer. Okay, that we just uh, explained earlier. Then you get your AM signal. So this is pretty much your AM signal that you get. Um, uh, and the same idea actually applies for all different type of modulation, uh, including uh, uh, digital uh, communication. 
it's an idea similar. There's some uh, variations uh, uh, of it. So for instance, if you have an analog signal, you need to change it to digital. But then at some, pro at some point, you will still need an oscillator. You will still need a carrier frequency. So the idea is very similar to what we also use with other type of technologies. Okay, so now uh, let's let's put our hat, AM hat and let's look at it from an AM perspective. You get an AM signal, and generally you're ready to to send your signal to the tower, and then the tower will broadcast it through the air so that anybody with a radio can be able to detect this uh, the signal. Uh, before you send it off to the uh, to the um, to the cell tower, not the cell tower, to the uh, AM tower, uh, it is not a bad idea to amplify your signal. Uh, why do we amplify? Well, one reason to amplify is that we know that uh, transmission, as you send your wave through the air, it will diminish with time. The power will diminish as it travels through distances. Also, you it will counter the impact of noise. So amplifying before you send it off, it will counter the impact of noise as well. So that, that's something that you do want to do uh, before sending it uh, uh, through the air. Okay, so that's just a very quick uh, understanding of modulation, but really uh, kind of in general, but also specifically if we're looking at this picture for the AM uh, modulation, for amplitude modulation. On this slide, my, my interest is that you get a bit familiar with the shape of different signals. Uh, when we talk about AM and FM signals, simply by looking at the shape of the signal, let's say in the time domain, you should right away get a sense of what kind of signals we're talking about. So in this case, uh, let's say you get such a thing, you certainly notice that it is a sinusoidal, whether it's a sine or cosine, it doesn't matter, but at the end of the day, it is a sinusoidal signal, and it has a certain uh, amplitude, and it has a certain frequency. And uh, the uh, it's highly packed together, which means that the frequency, uh, the, the period is very small, uh, and the frequency, the, the frequency of this signal, the, um, the fundamental frequency, 1 over T naught, is very high. Uh, and that's what you wanted, right? You wanted a very high frequency if we're talking about a carrier signal. So this is really a carrier signal. It is a sinusoidal, it has a high frequency, and we said earlier when we talked about the uh, oscillators that you can certainly generate um, signals with an oscillator that can be in the uh, in the kilohertz, in the megahertz, and also in the gigahertz. Gigahertz for digital communication, satellite and uh, mobile communications and, and Wi-Fi, uh, megahertz for the um, FM, and kilohertz and megahertz for the AM. So that's, that's a carrier signal. So it looks like this. Uh, an information signal. An information signal could look with, I mean, there are different ways of an information signal. What we saw on the previous slide, that was an example. It looks a bit random, uh, it looks a bit unpredictable, and that's what an information signal is. It's the human voice, let's say if it's a human voice. Human voice is, is us talking, so we talk within a certain range from 20 hertz to 20 uh, kilohertz, and within there we will have certain power at different frequencies. Uh, so it will vary. It depends on the on the style of, of people and on the way they talk. Some people are monotone. Some people have have high pitch. Some others don't. So it depends on your your the the way that you talk and how uh, it is projected uh, on the spectrum. Uh, so if we are talking about a voice signal, there might be other type of signals as well. That's that's well whatever the case might be. We could just look at the the spectrum of these signals. Here, what you see on the right, this one here, we are just using an example. We're not using a human voice uh, example. If it was a human voice example, it's like the, the image that I showed you on the previous slide. Here, we're simply using a, a tone. A tone, so a to when we say tone, it means a certain frequency, right? A certain frequency. So it's a certain frequency, and um, when you have something operating at a certain frequency, it will be sinusoidal. Remember in lecture three, we said, any signal, whether it is uh, periodic or air periodic, you could break it down in terms of sines and cosines. Any signal can be broken down in terms of sines and cosines. Here, we are only looking at a tone, just a tone, so it's just one sinusoidal. It is spread out, it is spread out. So if you compare it to this one, it's highly spread out, which means that the period is way bigger than this one. And if, if the period is big, if you do one over the period, it means that the frequency of this one, the frequency, the fundamental frequency of this signal is small. Um, 
And one way to understand how this looks is by actually showing it in the frequency domain. This is a periodic signal. You look at it in the, you use Fourier series because it is periodic. You look at it in the frequency domain and you notice a spike at five kilohertz. And so we ask you, what is the bandwidth of this signal? Well, the bandwidth of this signal is five kilohertz. So that's, that's some information that we have for an information signal. Again, this is just a basic example of a tone. In reality, a voice is way more complicated than this. It doesn't look like this. Okay, what else do we have? We have an AM signal. Um, I think we talked about this in lecture two. Uh, there was a tree that I showed where we had the block diagram of transmitter, channel, and receiver. And I showed you all the different uh, wireline communication technologies, wireless communication technologies. And I mentioned to you that AM signals are broadcasted anywhere between 540 kilohertz up to 1.6 megahertz. Now, this might depend... Uh, plus or minus in different countries and in different uh, um, jurisdictions within a country, different provinces. But in general, this is a, a reasonable um, range between 540 kilohertz up to 1.6 uh, megahertz. Um, each each uh, of these stations, so basically between 540 kilohertz up to 1.60 megahertz, you have different radio channels. Right? So let's say you flip through the channel, you have a dial, you go through the different channels, Every channel, uh, music channel, a news channel, uh, and uh, some some other type of channel, any type of channels that you that you typically can hear on the radio, they have a certain bandwidth, right? So they have a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz, um, and there's a reason why it's 10 kilohertz. We'll talk about it later on, but there's a reason why it is at 10 kilohertz. In general, we take the voice. Um, although voice go up to 20 uh, kilohertz, we take it up to, we only take five of it. And when you look at it in the channel, it is double this. It is double the base band. So that's why we, they have, each channel have a, a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. Um, so that, what this means is that you have multiple channels. You can accommodate multiple channels. Each of them will simply use 10 kilohertz in the channel. And if you say, well, what is the AM signal? How does the AM signal look like? This is an example of how an AM signal looked like. Uh, in here, if you look at this, the, the envelope, if you will, here, or if you look at it here, it's kind of the flipped version of it. This is your signal here, your, your MT here, your information. It is encoded in the amplitude. And that's why it's called AM. AM stands for amplitude modulation. You code the amplitude of your signal on the carrier. You, you kind of embed your amplitude of your signal in the carrier of your signal, in the carrier. So you, you take this and this, you merge them together, and you put the information of this signal in the amplitude of the carrier. That's why it's called AM modulation. Now, uh, although, like I said, we're not going to cover um, uh, FM modulation on, in this lecture, uh, but FM modulation uh, it stands for frequency modulation. I just wanted to quickly show it to you. And we did talk about FA, FM in lecture two. It goes between 800, uh, eight, eight, sorry, between 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz. Uh, each station, each FM station has a bandwidth of 200 kilohertz. And if you look at the signal of it, do you look at the signal? The signal does not change in amplitude. The amplitude is always the same across the, uh, as you move in time, the amplitude does not change. I mean, it oscillates between positive and negative, but it's always at the same uh, level. Whereas here, the amplitude changes because you're using amplitude modulation. Here you're using frequency modulation. What changes is, in fact, the frequency of your carrier. You're changing the frequency of the carrier. In the intelligence, the signal, the signal, your message, is encoded in the frequency of your carrier, not in the amplitude. Whereas in AM, the information signal is encoded in the amplitude of the carrier, not the frequency. Okay, so this is actually very important. In AM modulation, the carrier frequency is constant. It doesn't change. Whatever the oscillator gives it to you, that's the way it is when it goes into the channel. The only thing that changes as it travels through the channel is the amplitude of the signal. In frequency modulation, the amplitude is constant. Okay, so that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the frequency of the um, of the carrier frequency. The carrier frequency of uh, here, this is the carrier frequency. This is what it changes. 
Okay, so I hope that kind of uh, uh, kind of gives you a sense. So just by looking at it, you see that this is highly uh, it repeats and it's very uh, uh, it, it repeats very quickly. It uh, uh, it has uh, they're very packed together, so it means that the frequency is very high and that looks like a carrier frequency. This looks right away because the amplitude changes. This looks right away like an AM signal. This, uh, the amplitude doesn't change, but the frequency changes. Uh, it's more spread out, it's more tightly packed, more spread out, more tightly packed. Um, so that's, that's what it means. So if it's more tightly packed, it means it's a positive voltage. If it's more spread out, it means it's a negative voltage, okay? Um, so I hope that that clears uh, what it is. So this picture is detected with here, with the envelope, whereas this picture is also uh, encoded in the frequency of it, okay? Uh, let's move on. Since we're talking about AM and FM, and AM and FM are based on, on you know, the voice that you're sending, so you're receiving the voice of some, some broadcaster, some news person on the radio, uh, the, the, the idea of transmitting a voice signal and the idea of receiving a voice signal, it, 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 it becomes important to actually understand how is the human voice, what are the frequencies that we talk about for the human voice. I think I, I mentioned it on the previous slide and perhaps in, in, a, in previous lectures, but I still wanted to dedicate a, a slide to this. So as we said uh, maybe before, the audio frequency, the frequency for when, you, when a human speaks is somewhere between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So it, it, it is spread out somewhere between this range. This is the, the spectrum of the frequency spectrum of a human voice. By the way, maybe uh, I didn't mention frequency spectrum, but frequency spectrum is basically, it's another way of saying the frequency domain of a signal. So you have a signal, you use Fourier series or Fourier transform to look at it in the frequency domain. This thing that you see in the frequency domain, this is known as the frequency spectrum of a signal. Okay, so now we're looking at the frequency spectrum of the human voice. So human voice, um, it is a wave signal that you're creating and it has a certain frequencies. When we talk, we're, we're using certain frequencies. So we move, the humans are able to move anywhere between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. It doesn't mean that they have the same power at all the different frequencies. In fact, this is an image that I found on, uh, on stackexchange.com uh, and it shows the spectrum of the human voice. And I mean, this is for, for, for a certain pronunciation of the word O. Right, so you see here the word O, this is how it looks like, the spectrum of somebody saying the word O. And it, this will, in fact, change from one person to another. It will change if uh, a person uh, will say the word O as opposed to another person. It will also sometimes change from, from male to female, depending on the, on the, um, on the, uh, the, the way the voice is, uh, is, is, um, is perceived on the spectrum. So there's some studies, there's some peer review papers that looks at the, at the different uh, spectrum of the human voice depending on, on the, the b between male and female. Um, so anyway, so if we look at it here, the spectrum for this one here, for this kind of one specific person that did this, it ranges between, in fact, zero, it should range between zero to 20 uh, kilohertz. But in reality, as you notice, uh, whether for or, or for any other thing, the the importance of higher end frequencies, so let's say from 5 kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz, is very minimal. It is still there. You still have information in the signal. Uh, so there's still some power in that signal, but it diminishes, it diminishes. So what generally uh, companies do that, uh, that, that transmit voice signals, so telephone companies or even uh, radio uh, communication, they chop it. They chop it up to five kilohertz, sometimes up to less than five kilohertz, sometimes up to three kilohertz, and then they drop everything else. And the reason is that if they were to include everything, the bandwidth will be tremendously large. And if you have a lot of a big bandwidth, then it means you can have less uh, AM radio channels, right? You cannot accommodate more radio channels. So in order to accommodate more radio channels, the uh, the voice signal is chopped chopped to five kilohertz not more than that although we can speak up to 20 kilohertz and only this information is what is sent in the air now what this means is that in general for the perception for human perception we are able to understand uh, somebody speaking up to five kilohertz uh, the other information is lost 
Uh, it is sad that it is lost. Uh, it diminishes the quality, but we're still able to understand when somebody speaks up to five uh, kilohertz. Okay. Uh, when you put it in the basement, when you put it in the channel, the like I said on the previous slide, the frequency, this five kilohertz, is multiplied. It becomes ten kilohertz. It becomes two times. And if, and if you want to understand why, we could just look at uh, the images that I showed you for the spectrum of the aperiodic signal. So human talking is an aperiodic signal you use for your transform. You look at it in the frequency domain. It looks something like this. It could perhaps go a bit more to 20 kilohertz, but we filter it. We filter it. We use a low pass filter to filter it up to five kilohertz. We drop the rest. And this is, this is what you send in the channel. When you send it in the channel, all of this, all of this, uh, will move into the channel. It will go at a certain carrier frequency. And uh, if you look at the bandwidth now, this thing here, it is from FC plus five kilohertz minus FC minus five kilohertz. And so this means that this bandwidth is 10 kilohertz, whereas this bandwidth here is five kilohertz. Negative bandwidth is never measured. So, so I mean, that's why we, like we told you on the previous slide, every radio channel will have a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz in the channel. That's, that's the reason. And that kind of, I hope, gives you a, a sense of why we use um, 5 kilohertz in the base band or 10 kilohertz in the channel for the human voice, although we speak up to 20 kilohertz in the base band. So if, let's say, we would have used 20 kilohertz in the base band, right, uh, in the channel, this would mean that the bandwidth is two times this, so 40 kilohertz. And if you have 40 kilohertz, you are, basically what this means is that you will have uh, four times less radio channels because you your every channel will be using so much bandwidth uh, and you'll have four times less uh, radio channels. So if you are in, uh, I don't know, in, in, a, in a city or a country where there are 16 um, AM channels, uh, if you divide by four, then that means that you will have only four as opposed to 16 channels. So uh, from a business point of view and from a, um, I guess, uh, societal point of view, having more channels is more interesting. And so that's why, well, this is one other reason why we chop it down to only five and then uh, accommodate more radio channels. So I hope that kind of gives you a sense of, uh, of what it means. If we're talking about uh, analog uh, communication, we said there are three type of modulations, you know, AM, FM, and PM, and we said this maybe in lecture two or, or, or lecture one. Uh, here I wanted to show you how this is uh, manifested by looking at the carrier frequency. So we said at the end of the day, you have your signal, audio signal, computer signal, whatever signal you have, any important message that you're trying to send, this signal that you want to send, and let's say you're using a, an analog type of communication, you need to somehow encode it into a carrier. And you might ask, but what is a carrier signal? And we said the carrier signal is pretty much just a sinusoidal. It is generated by an oscillator, just a typical sinusoidal. We've seen sinusoidals a lot in this course. And the only uh, a difference is that this sinusoidal has a very high frequency here. The FC is very high. So kilohertz, megahertz, or gigahertz. Kilohertz, megahertz for AM, uh, megahertz for FM, and gigahertz for um, digital uh, wireless communications. Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, satellite communication, and the rest. Okay, so now if you are trying to, uh, uh, to encode information, your signal in the amplitude, right, if you're trying to encode it in the amplitude, you are essentially putting your information signal here in this amplitude. And that's why when we saw AM modulation, we saw that the, this amplitude keeps changing. It wasn't uniform. It wasn't this peak amplitude. It wasn't just a, a steady at a certain level, right? It was just fluctuating. And it had the shape of the message signal. So if you're using AM, this is where you, you want to put your information here. You want to encode it here. Now we'll, we'll, talk, we'll see it later on. If you're using FM, uh, rather, this doesn't change. This remains constant and you're putting your information here. Uh, if you're using AM, this changes, but this remains constant. If you're using FM, this your information, your message is encoded here, but this remains constant. And if you're using PM modulation, uh, then uh, you are putting it in the phase. You're putting your information in the phase 
This remains constant and this remains constant. PM is not something that we will see here. Um, we won't even have time to see FM, but I still wanted to compare FM with AM. So um, either way, whether you're using it for AM, FM or PM, FC is a high frequency. And you should always remember this. FC, the carrier frequency, will be significantly larger than the bandwidth of MT. MT was, what did we say MT is? It is the information signal, the, the, the intelligence, the information signal, the signal that you want to transmit, you talking, this is what it is. If we look at MT in the frequency domain, this is kind of a, let's say, a representation of it. And let's say we're talking about human voice, and human voice is up to 5 kilohertz that we will use in the baseband. So FC, FC, the carrier frequency of your communication should be significantly larger than 5 kilohertz. And this is what it is, right? FCs, uh, we said typically it is in the uh, um, higher end of kilohertz, you know, 500 kilohertz and in, in, uh, 550 kilohertz and, and beyond. Uh, they are in the uh, megahertz and they are in the gigahertz. So this is already large, but you should also see it uh, from this perspective. So this is kind of uh, uh, an addition of what I just mentioned, the three parameters of the carrier signal, this, 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 one, two, three, um, uh, uh, carrier amplitude, carrier frequency, and the carrier phase um, are used to embed the information or the signal, of the, the useful information that you want to send. And it depends on which one you use, then you either use AM, FM, or PM. In order to understand AM modulation, what we will do here for the analysis, we will consider a single tone. So a single tone essentially is just a sinusoidal uh, that is operating at a specific frequency. So the, the, the F naught uh, that operates at a specific uh, fundamental frequency, its own frequency. So this is it. Let's assume uh, we have this kind of signal. Right, and we are putting it into the modulator, so it's an input to the modulator. Another input to the modulator, or it is kind of inherent inside the modulator, is the oscillator. So you have the uh, electronic oscillator that is that is there that, that will produce your uh, carrier uh, signal, and what you get at the output is your uh, AM signal. So let's kind of look at it in a more uh, careful way. So. Um, you have your signal, so we said it's a tone, so a tone is just a sinusoidal. If we write it mathematically, we could just write this, so uh, V of M, M for message or information signal, and it has an amplitude and it has a specific frequency. So it runs, um, I, maybe I said F naught, but in general, in this case, it runs at a frequency FM, so it's just one tone. Uh, human uh, speech is certainly multiple frequencies at different powers, but this is just a basic example that we're using. The uh, uh, carrier frequency, it is represented by this, and we've seen this before, so it has a certain amplitude in a certain uh, frequency, omega c, uh, which, by the way, so you know that omega m and omega uh, c, they are basically the uh, radial frequencies. So if we were to write it in terms of, um, if we basically want to see the, the actual frequency, you just essentially each of them is simply 2 pi, the frequency, the specific frequency uh, that is um, the, of each signal. Okay, and we know uh, for a fact, as mentioned before, that the uh, carrier uh, signal will certainly have a, a frequency that is uh, significantly larger than this frequency. So if you will, FC will be way, way larger than FM, okay? Okay, let's continue. So uh, you put them into a, um, the AM modulator, and the output is what you get. This is what you get. And we said that the information in AM uh, modulation is encoded in the amplitude. So essentially, uh, the amplitude of your carrier. If this is my uh, uh, the amplitude of, of the carrier, then I'm going to encode this signal in here, I'm going to embed it together. And that's what what we're doing here. We're just adding the signal, the signal for the information. This is our useful information, and this is our carrier VC in this. So we simply add it together, and it becomes like this. So don't forget your brackets around it, uh, and then you put your um, your sinusoidal so that it uh, it it helps uh, take your envelope and it let it uh, travel across the air. Okay, so instead of this, if I just write the actual thing, I could just write it like this. 
Now, uh, if we look at this and we look at the AM signal, so this, the result that you get from an AM modulator is the AM signal, right? So you have to be careful. It's not the dotted line. The dotted line is not the AM signal. This thing here, this thing that goes up and down and has a varying amplitude, this is your AM signal. So this is this, not the, the, the surrounding, not the envelope. Okay, so let's, uh, like, like I show you here in the arrow, this is what, what you see. So the entire signal is these lines. Now, what about the envelope? The envelope is this. This component here, this component here is the envelope. So the envelope is not your AM signal. It is just the envelope of your AM signal. So this is not what you're sending in the channel, not the envelope. You're actually sending the signal itself, right? So this is a, uh, a confusion that I noticed with some students. Okay, so now we see the envelope. The envelope is this thing here, the dotted line that we can observe uh, around the actual signal that we transmit. But what goes into the air is this darker line that goes into the air uh, from your modulator. Um, now, uh, I wrote here to you that the information message signal is embedded in the amplitude of the carrier signal. And, and this is kind of what we saw here. Right? So, so your message, this thing here, is embedded in the amplitude and we just mentioned it to you um, a second ago. So let's uh, move along. Um, so, okay, so now instead of showing you this, uh, maybe we could show you the details of the modulator, what actually happens in the modulator. Because uh, sometimes the students, what they think is, because it's a modulator and you said we have a, um, a mixer, a frequency mixer, then perhaps many students I had in the past, they think that we are taking this signal, this thing here, and then we're multiplying them together. This is true. Uh, there is some truth to that, but it's not quite like this, right? So you have to be careful. If this is the result that we get and we take apart this modulator and we look really deep inside it, this is what we get. So you get your information signal here. It is fed into this box, this blue box, which is your modulator, kind of like this. And what you get is your AM signal. So it's this thing here that you get. Now, what is the modulator? What's inside the modulator? So the way the modulator works is that you have a DC offset. You have some voltage. This voltage comes from the carrier signal. You have a DC offset. We saw a DC offset in lecture four, so I hope you know what it is. It's just basically a DC uh, uh, voltage that you're adding to your signal. So you have an AC signal, you add a DC uh, voltage to it. And in fact, you could generate a DC um, offset or you could get a, um, a DC uh, value that is added to a sinusoidal, let's say, or to an AC signal, perhaps using an op amp, an operational amplifier. That, that could uh, um, kind of uh, get you the, your, your DC offset that you want it. Okay, so let's assume you have an op amp within the, uh, the AM modulator. It creates a DC offset. You add it to your AC signal. You add it to this tone that you have. Once you get, once you do this, this is what you have so far. This is what you have at this point. At this point, you have your VC plus your information signal. Now you take this and you multiply it with a sinusoidal. You take it, you multiply it with a sinusoidal, and the result that you get in the output is here. Okay. So you have to be careful here. The this information here, the uh, the carrier signal is kind of broken apart in two parts. The sinusoidal part by itself with an amplitude of one, and then the amplitude of itself, which acts as a DC offset. So just be careful about that. Um, what do we say here to you? So the DC offset must ensure uh, uh, it must ensure that the information message signal will have positive voltage. So you have to make sure that you do a, a certain DC offset in such a way that the entire wave that you get, right? This wave that you get, the entire uh, information signal that you get, it's entirely in the positive side. It's not in the negative side, right? So this is what you want to make sure. Um, this is very critical. Otherwise, the message cannot be detected at the receiver, right? So uh, you'll, you'll have um, overmodulation, and this will not help you uh, detect the... Um, the, the message of the receiver. So essentially what you want to uh, make sure uh, that you have is that um, your uh, the, the voltage here, the offset, could either equal to, um, to, to the amplitude of your tone or it could be bigger, right? This is, this is the requirement. If it's not like this, if you don't meet this, then your, this curve here, 
the 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 envelope, if you will, of your uh, AM signal will be in the negative side. And that's not what you want, right? You want it to be entirely in the positive side. And that's why we, you have to make sure that your DC offsets meets this requirement, okay? So again, if you don't meet this requirement, so if Z, VC, if the amplitude of the carrier is equal to the amplitude of the, of the information signal, you're okay. If the amplitude of your carrier is bigger than the information signal, you're okay. If the amplitude of your carrier is less than the, inf the amplitude of the information signal, then you're not okay. You will not be able to get a, a proper a signal that can be detected at the receiver. So you have to be extra careful here uh, when you pick your DC offset. In here, my uh, goal is to kind of uh, show you how uh, we could further analyze the AM signal in time domain. So this is what we got so far for the AM signal. It is in time domain. This is how it looks like in the AM, uh, uh, AM domain. Can we somehow expand this expression? And we want to do this expansion not just because we want to only focus on the time domain. This time domain expansion will, in fact, lead us to the frequency domain, right? We will break it down uh, into sinusoidals. And when we break down a signal into sinusoidals, as you know from lectures three and lecture four, uh, it, then we will be able right away to see it in the frequency domain. And that's kind of the reason of, of this slide. So let's, let's uh, do this. So essentially here what I did is I, uh, I wanted to show you the, um, the uh, instead of the message here that we have the tone, let's just put it in, let's just put it in inside the envelope and let's distribute the sinusoidal of the carrier to the uh, to the bracket. So you will end up with this and this part here. If you notice this part here, this is exactly your um, carrier uh, signal, whereas this part here, you have uh, the amplitude and you have the two sinusoidals. You have the first sinusoidal from your message your tone, and you have the next sinusoidal for the carrier. Um, if we open a sidebar here, uh, and in this sidebar, I just wanted to show you this uh, trigonomic tr uh, trig identity. And we saw this, uh, or you saw this in, in some of the math courses that you've taken, where you, when you multiply two sinusoidals, two, uh, two sines, so sine of something times sine of something else, uh, it, what you get is this, 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 this expression here. You get a half, cosine of the difference minus cosine of the addition. So this is what you get. So this is just a sidebar. Let's use this in here. So instead of these two signs, let's just kind of express it in this form here. Let's consider A to be WC because it's bigger. And let's consider B to be WF because it's smaller. But if you do the, the reverse, that's fine as well. You'll have a minus. Uh, cosine of a minus is always a positive, so you could adjust it that way as well. So let's do that. Let's do that. Let's use this uh, trig identity in the expression. And this is what we end up getting. We end up getting um, the amplitude of the message divided by two, uh, cosine of the um, uh, uh, of this, this expression, WC minus WM, so omega C rather, minus omega M, and you have minus, so be careful here, you have a minus, because we took it from here, VM divided by two, cosine of um, uh, omega C plus omega M. Now, let's say we don't want to see the omegas, we want to see it in terms of actual frequencies, and we know that these omegas, they are the radial frequencies, uh, so every time you see a radial frequency, it's just essentially two pi, the frequency, uh, the corresponding frequency. Let's, so let's just do that. Let's just do that. And this is what we get. This is the, uh, the expression that we get, right? So in here, you, uh, we broke it down into, uh, into this expression that we have for the AM signal. We, in fact, broke it down into various frequencies. So at this frequency, you have this component. At this frequency, you have this component. And at this frequency, you have this component. This is the frequency of the carrier signal. This is the uh, information message, but it's not together. It's split into two parts. One half of it is in on this frequency, FC minus FM, and the other half is on FC plus FM. Now, what about the minus here? Do we care about the minus? Well, the minus will not matter for us because when we look at it in the frequency domain, uh, we said we always look at it as an absolute value. We look at it as a peak 
voltage. So when you look at uh, the frequency domain, you look at it at, and on the y-axis as peak voltage and on the x-axis as frequency. Uh, and once you have it in uh, peak voltage, you could then, in fact, change it to dBm uh, so that you have exactly what you would see with a spectrum analyzer. So this is really the result that we got for the tone signal with AM modulation. So it's very interesting what we got here. Let's see how we can see this in the frequency domain. Okay, so now that we've analyzed the signal in the time domain, let's look at it and let's let's look at it in the frequency domain. I think we are equipped to see it in the frequency domain. We got a nice expression that will help us see it in the frequency domain in an easy way. So before we continue, uh, again, we have our uh, AM uh, modulator. So uh, this is what, what we have. And uh, within the AM modulator, you have, of course, your carrier signal. So this is it, and you also have some information signal. Let, we are considering a tone, and that's entering here. And uh, the output that you get is your AM signal. So this is your AM signal. I showed it to you in two format. The typical format where you have the envelope uh, expressed in it, and the other format where it's actually broken down in a way that one can use for the frequency domain. So here, there's nothing new. I just rewrote, rewrote it as for convenience to you from the previous slides. I just kind of summarized it here on this slide. So now let's 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 have the um, let's 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 have a lens where we're looking at all these signals in the frequency domain. Let's see how it's done. So for the first one, for the first one, for the information signal, you have it in the frequency domain. You know that omega m is simply two pi fm, so it operates at frequency fm. Uh, FM for voice, it could be somewhere between zero to uh, b rather be from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. We said typically when you transmit it, um, uh, audio communication, you people generally consider it from anywhere from um, up, I, I don't know, for anywhere from 20 hertz up to uh, five uh, kilohertz. So the realistic bandwidth uh, of it is anywhere from three kilohertz to five kilohertz. The rest is dropped because the power is low. So, so this is what you get. You get a spike, you get a spike at frequency FM, and it has a value, it has a peak value, VM, okay? And this is its bandwidth. This is the bandwidth of it. The bandwidth of it is in fact equals to FM. Okay, so there's nothing new here. This is directly from lectures three and four. For the carrier signal, uh, what we have is this. So the carrier signal, as you notice, um, uh, let me just show you in, in a second. So for the carrier signal, what we have is we have this expression here. It operates at frequency uh, omega C. So it, it will be at a frequency FC. FC is certainly way higher than FM. We said that it has to be this way so that the signal can travel a long distance. And it has a certain peak voltage of VC. For the AM signal, this is where things get interesting. Uh, if you look at this, then unfortunately you cannot, it doesn't help you uh, to see it in the frequency domain. That's why we had to do the previous slide where we broke it down into sinusoidals. And what you have in the sinusoidal is essentially um, a, a bunch of sines and cosines. But for the frequency domain, whether you have a sine or cosine, it does not matter. We said before, as we saw in lecture three and four, doesn't matter if you have sine or cosine, it will simply be a peak because we're looking at it at the, in the magnitude, we're not looking at the phase. And so sine, cosine, they are the same thing. So you have one uh, peak, you have one uh, spike at uh, frequency VC. So it's frequency VC, we have a spike with value uh, VC, with the peak value uh, VC, so, uh, so the peak voltage for the uh, carrier. We have another uh, spike at frequency FC minus FM. So if this is FC, we go down by FM, so this is FC minus FM, and it has a peak val voltage of VM over two. And we have another, uh, uh, spike at FC plus FM. So if this is FC, we go up by FM, and this is what we get, right? We go up by FM, this is what we get, and it has a voltage of VM divided by two, not minus VM divided by two, because we're doing absolute value. So the minus is, it's, it is in fact a plus now. So it becomes like this, and this is what you get. So these two, they are very, they are symmetric to each other, right? So if you look at them, they have the same height, 
um, and they are FM, uh, a bandwidth of FM away from the center frequency, from the carrier frequency, okay? And if you check what is the bandwidth, the pass band bandwidth of this signal, well, you go from this point to this point, okay? So this is the bandwidth, and if you measure it, it's basically two times FM, whereas the baseband bandwidth is simply FM, okay? So now we have the signal in time domain, we have the signal in frequency domain, we have the carrier in time domain, we have the carrier in frequency domain, we have the AM signal in time domain where the envelope is shown, we also have the AM signal in time domain where it's broken down in sinusoidal, and because of this, we are able to see it in the frequency domain, uh, and right away we're able to, once you are in the frequency domain, looking at the bandwidth becomes very easy. So it's just, this is the bandwidth, this is the bandwidth. It becomes very clear. Now, let's say um, uh, we want to identify these different spikes. They have names. So the center one is clearly this, which looks exactly like this. So this is the carrier signal. Your carrier signal is here. And it's all, it's, it should always be taller than the other two. In general, if you want to have a reliable signal, this should be bigger than the other two. The other two, they have names. The one on the left is known as the lower sideband, and the one on the right is known as the upper sideband. Right? So LSB, lower sideband, and USB, uh, upper sideband. Okay? Uh, and the voltage that they both have is not VM, it's divided by two. Right? And if you add them together, they become your VM. So your message signal, the amplitude of your message, is split into two parts. One part on this side at this frequency, the other part at this part at this other frequency. Now, what if we have this uh, expression, all of them, uh, all of them, this one here, this one here, and this one here, and we want you to, instead of getting the result in, um, in peak voltage, in voltages, we wanted to see it in dBm. So and we want to see it in dBm. What would you do? Well, basically, you would use the same equation that we derived before. Right? These are all sinusoidal. This is a sinusoidal, this is a sinusoidal, this is a sinusoidal. So this equation holds. So what it is, is you take whichever value of the voltage you have, you put it inside this, uh, you do the log, you multiply by 20, you subtract 10 log 10 of the internal resistance or the load uh, of your system, and this will be given to you. If it's not, you can assume a 50 ohm, uh, and then you add 27 to it. And then you'll be able to represent this in um, instead of voltages as dBMs, and dBMs are what you see with a spectrum analyzer. So I hope this kind of helps you see the AM signal now in the frequency domain, and it makes a bit more sense um, when we see it in the frequency domain. Okay. Okay, so in order to make things more clear, let's look into a numerical example. So, uh, and the, the objective of, the, of this example is basically to see if we're able to show the AM signal uh, in the frequency domain. So spectrum, that's what it means. So let's read the question together. A signal tone, so a signal tone message, so it's just a, a sinusoidal, with amplitude of two volts. So anytime you see the word amplitude, it means that we're talking about the peak uh, amplitude, right? So two volts, amplitude, and frequency of five kilohertz. Five kilohertz, that's like we said, it is, um, uh, it is a reasonable, uh, bandwidth or frequency for a, um, a sound wave, a sound signal. It is transmitted over a carrier signal operating at 600 kilohertz. 600 kilohertz, that's reasonable uh, frequency for the carrier when we talk about uh, AM modulation, and with an amplitude of 4 volts, which means that the peak voltage of the carrier is 4 volts. Uh, consider a load resistance of 50 ohm. In the past uh, lectures, I said that if the resistance is not needed and you think that you might need it, assume a 50 ohm, um, that's fine. But when you do this in an evaluation, don't assume a resistance unless it is mentioned in the question. So I will specifically mention the resistance to you, the internal resistance or the load resistance. Um, so you don't need to assume that when you do an evaluation, a quiz or a midterm. Okay. And now you need to find these four different uh, questions. Question one, express the message uh, signal, the carrier signal, and the AM signal in the time domain. So basically just show us how the, the, uh, the signal is, is expressed mathematically. Plot the spectrum of the AM signal. So we want to see the AM signal in the frequency domain. 
And we want to see it initially as voltages versus frequency. And then later on, we could move it into dBm versus frequency. So we do it in two steps. This will help us get the other one. C, find the bandwidth of the AM signal. So what is the bandwidth? Uh, you, we said it is always good to uh, plot the spectrum. And then from the spectrum, we will be able to identify the bandwidth. Uh, and then D, can this uh, message signal be detected at the receiver? So it's just a question uh, that we ask, we ask you, can this signal this AM signal be detected at the, um, uh, not really the AM signal, but can the message embedded in the AM signal be detected at the receiver? So let's go and do this problem together. So next, uh, let's begin with A. Uh, so in terms of uh, finding the, um, the, the signal for the, the message, we said it's a tone. So we know right away it will be a sinusoidal. So it's a sinusoidal, it is expressed like this. It has a certain voltage in a sinusoidal uh, expression. The voltage, it is two volts. So you could just write your two here, sine, and then the omega m is simply two pi fm t. Uh, what is fm? Well, fm, we said uh, it, it is this frequency here. So it is five kilohertz. So that's good, we got this part here. Now let's do express the carrier signal. So for the carrier signal, uh, this is how you would do it. We know that it is also a sinusoidal. Uh, it also has a, um, a peak uh, uh, voltage or an amplitude. It is four, four volts. And it operates at another frequency. Uh, the frequency is higher than the other one, higher than the, this, um, this message. It is at uh, 600 kilohertz. So that's done as well. The, the third part that we're interested to find is, the, uh, is expressing the AM signal. So let's see the AM signal. The AM signal, we could write it as such. As we said before, the, your message, it is embedded in the amplitude, and this is the, the carrier signal. And if we plug in the value, VC, we know it's four. VM, we know this, so we could just rewrite it. And this, we, we could also rewrite this, the, the carrier. And we have all the relevant values here. If we do the multiplication, and we showed you how to do it in the, uh, previously. Essentially, it will be uh, three sinusoidals. The first sinusoidal will take care of the carrier signal. So this thing here is exactly your carrier signal. The two other parts are essentially also sinusoidals, uh, but with cosine instead of sine. And, and then one of them will be minus, this one here, uh, the one at the higher frequency. And the frequencies at which they appear is at FC minus FM. FC minus FM and FC plus FM. We have FC, it is 600. We have FM, it is five. So 600 minus five, 595 kilohertz. 600 plus five, 605 kilohertz. So we have all that. Um, I think with this, uh, we basically answered A. So we pretty much answered question A. We expressed all of them in the time domain, okay? Uh, in fact, if you would have only showed this, this is fine as well. Uh, but this, this view will in fact help us when we move to B, to plotting the spectrum. So this is uh, useful to see uh, the envelope of the signal, to see, the, uh, to see the, the envelope of the AM signal. And this is useful because it will help us um, uh, show the, this AM signal in the frequency domain, which we will do right now. So if we do it in the frequency domain, this is what you get. So you get three spikes. The first spike is the center spike. It, uh, it's at FC, so it's at 600 uh, uh, kilohertz. So 600 here, FC, and this is in kilohertz, this axis. Uh, I put two lines like this, which means that this is a long line. So just to tell you that this is not necessarily um, uh, up to scale. So part of this is chopped. When you see these two lines, it means part of the x-axis is chopped because otherwise it would take a, a bigger slide and, uh, and we don't have that. So that's what these two lines mean. It means that we chop part of the axis. So it's, it's a higher frequencies and this is what we see. We see a, the center at 600 kilohertz. We see the lower sideband at 595 kilohertz. We see the upper sideband at 605 kilohertz. And now be careful with the amplitude of, uh, of each, of each spike. This one here, the first one, it has exactly the, uh, the, the value for the peak voltage of the carrier. So four volts, this is the peak voltage of the carrier, okay? 
and the other two, they will have half, half of what you have uh, for the peak voltage of the message. It's two volts, so you split it in two parts, one volt for this and one volt for this, and that's what you get. Okay, and uh, so so this is what we got. This is basically the spectrum of the AM signal as voltages versus frequency. Now, um, if we want to see the bandwidth, which is part C, uh, so we still have to do this dBm versus F, but just very quickly for the bandwidth. Well, the bandwidth, you could visualize it here. It's between this one and this one. And in fact, the bandwidth will be two times FM. So 2 times FM, FM is 5 kilohertz, so 2 times that is 10. If you don't believe me, you could just take this, 605 minus 595, and that's your 10 uh, kilohertz. Okay, so that's the bandwidth of the AM signal. Okay, uh, if I ask you what is the bandwidth of the baseband message signal, it is 5 kilohertz. What is the bandwidth of the AM signal? It is 10 kilohertz. Okay, so you have to, to distinguish between both. Now let's draw the same uh, spectrum, but now in terms of dBm versus frequency. Uh, so if we do that, this is what we get. This is what we get. So we get this result here. Uh, the places where the spike happens is the same. So there's no changes. So this axis is the same. I keep it the same. The values here, however, will be different. Values here will be different. Here, notice that I wrote P. Uh, AM. So PAM, the power a AM, and we're actually measuring it in dBm, power of dBm's. And uh, for the message, we could just use the equation that we derived in lecture three, we and that we used in lecture four, and that we were using, that we're going to use right now as well. And this equation holds because these things are sinusoidal, 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 sinusoidal. This equation holds. So we plug in um, the peak uh, voltage. For the message, which is uh, one volt, one volt here, we put it in here, one volt, and we put the uh, load resistance, 50 ohms, plus 27. You do the math, it should be 10 dBm. So this is at 10 dBm. You, for the next one, we enter the voltage. The voltage of it is four uh, peak voltage. We put it in, we do the math, we get 22 dBm. This thing here is to scale. This is to scale. And this is also to scale. This is 1 volt, 2 volt, 3 volt, and this is 4. This is 10 dBm uh, uh, and uh, all the way up to 22 dBm. So if you notice, it's a bit, uh, it appears larger than this one. It, is, it appears larger than this one, but nonetheless, it is still shorter than the carry. That's, that's what it is. So it's a bit different because the scale is different. It's in dBm's, but this is the output that you get. This is exactly how you would see it with a spectrum analyzer. So we answered B as well. So I think moving from this to this should be straightforward. So in, in an evaluation, if I ask you to plot in dBm versus F, do it in two steps. Do it like this, uh, and then and then you could just right away change it to 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 dBm. Uh, so it, it it will be way easier to do it in two steps. Okay. Now uh, find the bandwidth of the AM signal. Well, the bandwidth is the same thing. We still see the bandwidth here between six uh, five ninety five kilohertz and six oh five, which is ten. Uh, um, kilohertz, and as you see it also here, 10 kilohertz. So the bandwidth is, is used in both of them as the same because it depends on the x-axis, and the x-axis did not change. Can the message be detected at the receiver? Um, well, in order to answer this, we this is what we need to uh, to do. Well, uh, um, so yeah, sorry, uh, I forgot to, to show you how the bandwidth is found. So it, this is what it is. You can see it uh, graphically, or you could simply multiply two times the uh, the uh, the bandwidth or the frequency of the tone. So two times that is 10 kilohertz, or you can see it in the graph 10 kilohertz. But now let's answer D. So uh, the answer is because this is a wireless communication, so AM, uh, FM, it's wireless communications. There are many random phenomena in wireless communication. So it's really hard to say if the signal will be detected reliably at the receiver. There are so many um, random phenomena that could harm your signal. There's attenuation, there's noise, there's interference, there's distortion. And these are different things that we specifically talk about in the wireless course. Uh, so I, I'm not going to discuss it too much here. But there are many factors that, that really we cannot really answer this with a reliable way. But we could at least say that in terms of the modulation, in terms of the modulation, we know that the amplitude of the carrier is 4 volts 
and the amplitude of the message is two volts. So four is certainly bigger than two. So right away, this is at least in, from this point of view, from a modulation point of view, it, it basically leads us to believe that yes, uh, we will be able to detect the signal reliably at, at the receiver. Okay, and we'll talk more about that uh, uh, in uh, in the upcoming slides. We talked about the envelope of the AM signal, and we said we can in fact uh, see it in mathematically in the uh, expression for uh, uh, the 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 AM signal. We can literally see it in that expression. We do, we said we showed you two ways of showing the AM signal. One way where the AM uh, envelope is shown. Uh, in brackets, so it's VC plus uh, the um, the message signal, uh, and we also showed you another way of looking at the AM signal, which is with broken down in sinusoidal, so that we can move to the frequency domain. So in this slide, I want to focus more on the envelope, and just to really show you how the envelope can be detected, uh, eh, like literally eh, from the AM signal. So. Uh, the envelope of an AM signal, right? The envelope of the AM signal contains the information message. So your original message, whatever it was, a song, somebody talking, whatever the original message is, the information signal, the useful uh, signal, the intelligence signal, this thing here is contained in your AM signal. It's literally contained in it. It, it, it is uh, visual. It, it, you can visually see it in the, in the signal. So if you have an oscilloscope and you look at your AM signal, you could right away detect uh, the um, your, your useful message, your information message, by looking at the envelope of the signal. This is the envelope of it. This is not the AM signal. This is the envelope of the AM signal. So you could right away see it there. Um, uh, and essentially, what you are want to make sure is that the shape of your original signal, this is your original signal. This is your original signal. If we are considering a tone, if we're if it's not a tone, if it's somebody talking, well, it will be. It would look something different. Still, whatever the case might be, this is you want it to be impressed on the AM signal. You want to see an impression of it on the AM signal. So the shape of the message signal should be directly shown in the uh, AM signal as as its envelope. So let's let's look at that. So if I show you this, look at it. If you drop it, it directly falls very nicely uh, as the envelope of this AM signal. What about the next one? If we see the next one, the, uh, the, the message signal directly falls as an envelope of the AM signal. So it means that right away we can detect the, uh, the useful signal. And this gives us um, uh, some assurance that uh, our information is is properly modulated. It is not modulated in a wrong way. Now, what happens to it in the channel, that's a different story. You have noise, you have distortion, you have interference, you have attenuation. These things could change your AM signal at the receiver, at the radio device that you have when you're trying to listen to music. That's a different story. But at least for when we send it, it's, it's encoded uh, uh, properly, okay? So that's, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to, to tell you here. Now, how to ensure that the message signal is properly embedded in the AM signal? Is there some, some metric, some reassurance metric to do that? Uh, there is. There is something that is called the modulation index. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an index. Usually when we say index, it's, it's a value that goes between 0 to 1. Uh, so this is what we will use. We will use a modulation index. This gives us a hint of how the modulation is done. If the index is anywhere between 0 and 1, it cannot be 0. 0, it means there's no modulation. But if, it, if it's above 0 and less or equal to 1, then it means your modulation is good. If it's anything uh, beyond that, it means it's not good. If it's 0, it means it's not good. There's no, mo there's no modulation if it's 0. So you have to really be above 0 and uh, less or equal to 1. Or sometimes we use it in percentage, this modulation index. We say there's a modulation index of, I don't know, 63%. So uh, instead of saying uh, between 0 and 1, we say between 0 and 100. Sometimes we use a percentage. So you should be 
you might see both of them. So let's define the modulation index related to uh, AM uh, modulation. So anytime we talk about AM modulation, people use this metric, this modulation index, to see if the embedding of the signal is properly done. So I'll, we'll, we'll see it on the next slide. In this slide, I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the actual definition of the modulation index. And then we'll show you different ways by which you could obtain the modulation index. So like we said, modulation index is represented by M. It is a value between 0 and 1 or sometimes between 0 and 100. So whatever results you get, if you multiply by 100, you could show it as a percentage. That's, that's also okay. Um, modulation index can never be a zero. If you have zero, it means you have no modulation. So that's meaningless. So you don't want an M equals zero. That's why it's greater than zero. It's not equal to zero. And modulation index can be one. That's, that's also possible. Uh, but it cannot be beyond one. So one is the, the, the maximum you could get. So you have to be anywhere in this range, above zero and less or equal to one. So the, the, the formal definition of modulation index uh, can be written as such. It is the peak of the message signal. So whatever it is, somebody talking, a, a tone, a sinusoidal, whatever it is, go ahead and find the maximum voltage of this uh, signal. And that's what you put at the top. In the bottom, uh, here I made a mistake. I wrote peak amplitude. Peak and amplitude, uh, it's kind of redundant. Uh, peak could be dropped. It is the amplitude of the carrier signal. So the carrier signal will always be a sinusoidal, right? And it has an amplitude. You simply put the amplitude of the sinusoidal in the bottom, okay? And that's, that's that. So why did I not write uh, VM here? Because I wanted to show you because in, in principle, the maximum value of, let's say, a tone is VM. I just wanted to show you in a very generic way, in such a way that it would work for all kind of signals, whether it's somebody talking, which may appear a bit different, um, may appear somewhat random, uh, different peaks, different heights, uh, different elevations uh, of power at different frequencies. And that's why the more uh, better way of representing this would be the, to take the maximum the maximum voltage of the um, of the signal, the maximum voltage of the uh, of the message or useful signal. Okay, so this is the formal definition of what modulation index is. Now let's see how it is for specifically for a single tone. So let's say you have just a sinusoidal. Uh, you, that this is your information message. Let's see how it looks like. So if you take the maximum of the um, information message, well, it's simply it's V. Uh, M, right? The amplitude of the sinusoidal. This is how it would look like for a specific uh, tone. When we talk about a single tone, this is what it is. In the bottom, you have the amplitude uh, of the carrier. So it's the amplitude of your message over the amplitude of the carrier. And the limit of it is always between zero, greater than zero, less or equal to one. Okay. Now let's show you another way of, uh, of detecting it. So let's say you have in front of you uh, on an oscilloscope, the uh, time domain. Uh, I mean, that's what an oscilloscope is, right? It shows you the time domain of a signal. It shows you the signal and time domain, and you have it in front of you. This is it. The red line is your AM signal. Um, it won't show you a blue line. This is just a, a rendering on this image, just to help us identify the um, the um, uh, the envelope. Otherwise, on an oscilloscope, you won't see the this blue line. You just see the red line. And then you could kind of imagine uh, uh, the impression of the signal uh, impressed on the, it. And this impression, this envelope, is essentially your your information message. So how can you find M from uh, by looking at it at the oscilloscope? Well, what you could do is you could find the uh, peak point, uh, the highest point of your um, of your AM signal, and to the lowest like this, so that you can find this uh, highest point, this value which we call here A, and you can find the lowest value between two uh, between the envelopes. So you could imagine an envelope around your signal. And you could find it, you could print your cursors, and then you could find A and B. And the uh, modulation index is simply A minus B over A plus B. So this is a useful equation when you are using an oscilloscope. 
using, using an oscilloscope, you put your cursors, you measure this A and you measure your B, and then you could assess it this way. And that also gives you the, um, the modulation index this way. Okay, so in reality, uh, what what you should uh, uh, realize is that there are different ways of getting the modulation index. I'll just show you another way uh, as well. Some some other useful uh, things to also recognize uh, when you look at um, when you look at your a AM signal is that the maximum the maximum right the maximum voltage the maximum uh, peak voltage of your AM signal it is equal to VC plus VM right VC plus VM. In the minimum, the minimum of the envelope, minimum of the envelope is from here, not from zero all the way here is VC minus VM. So these are also useful to know, right? So now we kind of gave you different way, different ways to understand M. So uh, in reality, what this means is that you have uh, four, let's say four different ways of getting M. Uh, if you want to find M, the modulation index, and you have an oscilloscope, use your A and B. A and B are useful. If you have an oscilloscope and you're looking at your AM signal, you could use your A and B, uh, activate the cursors and determine your M. That's one way of getting it. If on the other hand, um, you have uh, some information about uh, your um, uh, signals. So let's say you have the amplitude of your tone and you also know the amplitude of your uh, carrier uh, signal. You could just go back to the definition you could go back to the definition and use this, and this could help you find M. Uh, if, on the other hand, you are given some information about the signal, but you don't have the actual image of it, you're, you don't have a, a, an image, but you're given some information. You may, for instance, be given the maximum value of the envelope, which is this, VC plus VM, or the minimum value of the envelope, which is VC minus VM. If you're given this, you could use these two, uh, and you could use the definition and then work your way to finding M with this, with this, with this. Sometimes you're not giving any of this. You're just giving um, a result that you see, let's say, with a uh, spectrum analyzer. In a spectrum analyzer, it will show you uh, on the x-axis you have frequency. On the y-axis you have uh, the, um, the power, uh, the, the value in power in dBm. So if you have, a D, you have different spikes, for each spike, you could identify the carrier spike. So the carrier spike will, should be larger, which should be larger. And you have the DBM of the carrier spike. And you also have the uh, DBM uh, uh, power for the smaller side, low, uh, side bands, right? The lower side band and the upper side band, LSB and USB. Uh, and you could also have the DBM for that. So you could work your way um, you know, remember we showed you the, the we told you the how to move from DVM to peak voltages. Go through these processes that we talked about in lecture three and in lecture four, and find the peak voltages for the, uh, the lower sideband, upper sideband, and the center uh, carrier frequency. Once you have this VC and VM divided by two, you could then go back to the definition, and then you could find M. So here I, I pretty much showed you four different ways of finding M using the oscilloscope with A and B, using some, the definition with VC and uh, VM, using uh, VC plus VM and VC minus VM, the maximum value of the envelope and the minimum value of the envelope, and also using the um, result from a spectrum analyzer, right? So you could also find it with that. So four different ways of finding M. So I hope you, you find it useful. So sometimes you, uh, you might get some tricky questions in an evaluation. Uh, and you get lost, well, you have these four different ways of getting M. Okay, let's move on. So here, let's, let's see some examples of uh, what one may see uh, using an oscilloscope. And uh, from it, let's try to assess the modulation index. So you have this uh, signal here. You have this um, AM signal, right? Uh, and from it, uh, around it, you, you're able to detect an envelope. Uh, the, the upper envelope, you're also able to detect the lower envelope. And just by looking at it, uh, and let's say somebody asks you, is this, did the message properly encode? Is the message properly imprinted? Is the message properly uh, uh, embedded in the AM signal? You should right away say yes, because um, there is a gap between both of them. 
the lower envelope and the upper envelope are not overlapping. So this is right away a good uh, modulation. So this should be lead us to, to, to something that is good. Envelope detection can be applied. This seems good. There's, there's nothing alarming when we look at this in the time domain. So this is a good thing. And again, we did no math. We did none of that. We just observed. Just my observation. There's a gap between the lower envelope and the upper envelope. So that's a good uh, modulation, uh, AM modulation that was done at the transmitter. So now uh, we could, uh, uh, um, you know, bring on the, the cursors and we could uh, show um, the, the value. So we could just put it here. We could determine the value A and the value B. So A, what we notice is uh, a value of 3. So you're going from 1.5 to minus 1.5. So that's three volts, and B has a value of one. So this is minus 5.5 uh, 5 to 0.5, so the value of one. And we could just write it here as three volts and one volts. And now we could simply use the equation uh, uh, that we just showed you uh, earlier. Modulation index is equal to A minus B over A plus B. So we do three minus one over three plus one, that's two over four or 0.5 or 50%. So this is a modulation. Uh, index of 50%. And anytime your value falls between zero and one, you're good. I did not need to do any of this. Right away, just by observing it, I knew it's good. We showed you the, uh, this uh, smiley face. It's a good thing. Uh, the, the, um, the, the envelopes is not overlapping. So right away, we knew that our modulation index will be in this range. We knew that. Not even one. Right? If it was one, these two would be touching. The envelopes, the upper envelope and the lower envelope will be touching. It wasn't even one, so we knew it was going to be in this range uh, before even doing math. And that, that kind of confirmed uh, what, what we observed. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, this is another uh, example. Again, here, if I look at it without doing any math, um, I, there is the low, the upper envelope and the lower envelope. They're not... Um, one inside the other, right? They, they are properly, uh, they are connected, they're connected, but they don't uh, uh, interfere with one another. They don't overlap one another. So that's also a good thing, except now they're touching. So I know in this case, my M is expected to be one, right? So I know my M should be one. Envelope detection can be used. It is a good uh, modulation. There's nothing alarming about it. Um, uh, and I know right away that uh, the M will be one because the upper envelope and the lower envelope are touching. They're literally touching, right? You see that? They're touching. They're touching here, touching here, they're touching here. Okay. But otherwise, uh, uh, envelope detection can be uh, can be applied. We could see the signal properly uh, showing here. There is no specific gap between them, uh, but still it can be detected. Okay, so uh, let's bring our cursors and let's measure the um, uh, the, uh, the the highest uh, uh, voltages for the AM signal. Well, it goes from minus 2 volts to 2 volts, so A is 4. As for B, there's nothing, so B is 0. So I, I don't really need to do this. I could right away say it's 1. It's a, my modulation index is 100%. It's M equal to one. But if you, if we still want to show you the, how the equation works and how you could do it with the equation, you could just observe this. A, B is zero, put it in the equation. So uh, A is four, B is zero, put it in the equation. You get 100% as we uh, projected. Okay? So we got this without even math, but then math confirmed what we observed. So this is a second example. Let's see a third example here. If you see this example here, right away, you know there's something wrong because the lower uh, envelope and the upper envelope, they're kind of, um, they, they overlap. There's an overlap here. So right away, this is not a good thing. Your original signal is no longer easily detected. Part of it is detected. This part can be detected. This part can be detected. Here, completely lost. We don't, we don't know where it is. It's lost between uh, the, the, the lower and upper, there's something wrong here. So part of your signal is fine, but the, the remaining part of the signal is not so good, right? There is something that happened, and this is known as over-modulation, over-modulation. So the envelope cannot be detected properly. Not the entire thing. Part of the envelope can be detected. Part of the envelope can be detected. This part here is fine. These parts cannot be detected. So these parts are lost. We are lost, not a, not a good thing, not a good thing. Uh, and M certainly will be, uh, in this case, because we know there's an overlap between the upper 
um, envelope in the lower envelope, we know for sure M should be greater than one. M should be greater than one, okay? And again, like I said, this is known as uh, overmodulation. These factors uh, is known as overmodulation. Now, um, so what you should realize is that recovery of the original uh, signal message is not possible, right? It's not possible. The message signal will be distorted. Now, how much distortion? Well, this depends on what is M. Like, I mean, like how much did you oversample, uh, overmodulation? I'm sorry, not, not sampling. How overmodulation was, uh, how much, how, by how much did we overmodulate? This, if this is, if the overmodulation is too high, really, really too high, that means the distortion is very high. It's too, the distortion is highly uh, distorted. If, the, if it's less, then it's less distortion. In this case, you see distortion here, but the rest of the signal is fine, right? The rest of the signal, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Only these areas here, there's distortion. So um, we don't really, you don't necessarily need to know this, but somebody might ask you, well, how do you measure how much you oversampled? The metric that we showed you, right? So we showed you the metric uh, using M equals to VM over VC or um, M is equal to A minus B over A plus B. These only apply when M is between zero, greater than zero and less or equal to one. It doesn't work when M is greater than one. It does not work for that. So be careful, it does not work for that. But let's say you wanna find it for this. What is M for this such a case when we have overmodulation? So what you could do is, this is not this is kind of off the record, but you could still, I could still tell you how it's done. So what you do is you essentially find this, find this, right? And you find this and, um, uh, and then you do A minus B over A plus B and you do one over, you flip it. So this here is what? Minus 2.5 to 2.5. Uh, so this value is five. This value of overlap is, um, uh, is, is one, right? It's one. Uh, so this could be your A, A is five and your B is in fact a one. And what you do is you still use the same equation. You do uh, five minus one over five plus one. So that gives you four over six, or if you simplify that's two over three. And now you do the one over of, one over of. So you'll end up with three over two. And therefore this over modulation, it has an, an index of 150. So 1.5, 150. So these, this equation will not work, you, but you can still kind of tweak this equation to make it work when M is bigger. And basically you do the same thing. This would be your B, this would be your A. You enter it here, but you do minus, minus one over. You do a minus uh, one or one over, you flip it, uh, and you could get it. In other words, you could do A plus B over A minus B, where this is your A and this is your B, okay? So this is only a special case when M is greater than one. Otherwise, these equations that I showed you on the previous slide, in here, they only apply for M uh, greater than zero and less or equal to one. Okay, okay here we wanna show you how to find the power of the AM uh, signal. So in order to do this, I'm gonna just recap. So this is just a review of what we've done uh, before. So I'm just rewriting the AM signal in the time domain in the format where we have the envelope and in the format where we break it down in sinusoidals. Right, so this is the envelope and sinusoidals, and we said this one here is useful to when we move to the frequency domain. Also, anytime we work with power, it's always useful to look at it in the frequency domain uh, because um, if you have a spectrum analyzer, the value of the spikes, this is basically your power. But in this case, these are voltages, and we know that the carrier will have a voltage, uh, uh, this, VC, and the lower sideband and the upper sideband, each of them will have a voltage uh, VM divided by two. So this is specifically for uh, the, the tone. This is how it looks like. So how do we get the power of this uh, AM signal? Well, it's just straightforward. You find the power of this signal, you find the power of this signal, you find the power of this signal, and then you apply superposition. And we said what superposition is, you just add the different powers. Power of this spike, power of this spike, power of this spike, and this gives us the power of the uh, AM signal. That's it. There's nothing to it, right? So uh, let's just do it together, and uh, let's let's see how it's done. 
So um, one way of doing this, of course, is to use what we've talked about before. So find the power of each sinusoidal spike uh, and add them together. Apply superposition. This is kind of what we did in lectures three and lecture four, right? And we said there are five steps. So you have the peak values. This is the, the peak value of this one is Vm divided by two. The peak value of this one is Vm divided by two. The peak value of this one is Vc. So you find the peak values of each spike. You move to RMS. How do you move to RMS? They, they are all sinusoidals. So when you move to RMS, you take the peak value and you divide by square root of two. Once you have the RMS, then you can find the average uh, power. And the average power is basically just applying Watt's law, which is V squared, uh, and that's the RMS, this, divided by, let's say, uh, uh, the resistance, the, re the load resistance or the internal resistance of your system. And that finds you the average power. Okay, and once you have the average power, you could just find it in dBW. And once you have it in dBW, you could find it in dBm, right? You just add 30 to it. Or we, you could just use the equation that we showed you multiple times in lecture three, four, and or earlier in this lecture. So that's one other way of defining the power of the signal. You could do it for each of them and then add it together, and that finds you the power for the signal. Um, now, let's, let me show you how it's done uh, with an index. So how can we find the total power of the AM signal? Uh, but now where we actually have in the equation the modulation index. So let's see how to do that. So again, like we said, when you want to find the uh, power of the AM signal uh, by definition, and let's say we're doing this for the tone, you add all the different spikes. So you add PC. PC is the power of the carrier, this one here. PLSB, the power of the lower sideband. PUSB, the power of the upper sideband. So you just add all of them. So that's just by definition. Then what we observe is the following. The power of this one and the power of this one is the same. So why do I do it twice? I could just do two times uh, PLSB, or if you don't like LSB, you want to do it with USB, that's fine. You could do two times PUSB plus PC. That's just the simplification, just to make our life a bit easier. Okay. Next step, what we do is we find the RMS value of the peak, right? The RMS value of the peak. We square it and we divide by the internal resistance or the load, okay, uh, of the system. As for the other one, we multiply by two and we find the voltage of the lower side band, or if you work with the upper side band, you could find the, the voltage of the upper side band, but now not in peak, in RMS, in RMS, and you square it and you divide by the load resistance or the internal resistance, okay? So let's uh, continue. We said that RMS, anytime you work with RMS is whatever peak value it is, because it's sinusoidal, the RMS of a sinusoidal is always the peak of each corresponding one divided by square root of two. If I do that, you square it divided by uh, the uh, load resistance uh, plus two, uh, Vm. Uh, here, notice what I do. This is Vm divided by two. That's why there's a two here. It's Vm divided by two. It's not just Vm. The, the peak value of this one is Vm divided by two. Be careful here, okay? And divided by two, and I, I then divided by square root of two, so it becomes like this. I square it, divided by, by this. And uh, I could just maybe clean up a bit some stuff. So clean up the, the, uh, the equation, and um, I get Vc squared over two uh, R, two uh, times the resistance. And here I get, I, I multiply, I square the bottom, square the top, uh, multiply the two, I get Vn squared divided by four Rn. Now, uh, if you look at this, uh, this expression here, this expression here, this is your power for the carrier. This Vc squared over two Rn is the power for this one, for the carrier uh, signal. So this is Pc, and then the rest is this. Now, I open a sidebar. In the sidebar, I went to the definition of the modulation index. And why do we do this? Because we want somehow in the expression for the total power to have M in it. Somehow we want to have M in it. That's why we're doing this, this trick. So we go back to the definition of the modulation index. M is equal to the maximum uh, voltage 
a maximum peak voltage of the uh, message, which for a tone is just the amplitude of the message, Vm, over the uh, amplitude of the carrier uh, signal. And instead of this, I could just isolate for Vm. So Vm is equal to M times Vc. Uh, M is a modulation index. It's anywhere between 0 and 1. And Vc is the uh, amplitude of the carrier. And here, instead of Vm here, I could just enter M Vc instead of Vm, and I square it. So let's just do that. Let's do that. So instead of this, I could just write Pc. For Vm, I enter M Vc. I square it over Rn. I uh, clean up a bit, simplify, and I get this expression here. Then I also notice that this, I could in fact represent it in, in, in the form of Pc, form Pc, right? And we know Pc is equal to Vc squared over 2Rn. So I could split it, I could split it. I could have one part which is m squared over 2 times Vc squared over 2Rn. So let's do that. And this part is PC. So I could just rewrite it as PC. And PC and PC can be factored out. So all this to say that I could have the total power expressed as the power of the carrier times 1 plus m squared divided by 2. And that's kind of the interesting result uh, that we get. So it's just a fancy way of, uh, of also getting this. So if you are working with a tone and you are asked to find the total power, this could be quite useful. In fact, quite, quite fast. You could find it quite fast as opposed to this, which is very cumbersome. You have to do this for each of them and then you have to add it and so on. You could just find this and this is a, a quite a useful way. But you're assuming that somehow you have M or somehow you can find M. So this is a, an interesting result. Okay, so this only applies if your message is a tone. So you have to be careful here, only if it's, if it's a tone. Okay. Okay, so let's see an example of how we could uh, determine the power of an AM signal. So let's read the, uh, this example together. A signal tone message. So it's just a sinusoidal, uh, and this is your useful information message. Uh, has an amplitude, and the amplitude of it is Vm. Right, so this is the amplitude of this uh, uh, sinusoidal message. We don't know what it is, so it's just Vm. Um, and it has a frequency of three kilohertz. So three kilohertz is reasonable for a, um, a voice um, uh, signal. And that's, that's, that's reasonable, yeah. Three kilohertz, so it's somewhere between three kilohertz to five kilohertz that is typically used in transmission, as mentioned before. It is transmitted over a, a carrier signal operating at 550 kilohertz. Uh, and it has an amplitude of 10 volts. 10 volts is for the carrier. 550 kilohertz is for the carrier. 3 kilohertz is for the information signal. And Vm is the amplitude of the information signal. We also tell you, consider a load resistance of 40 ohms. So, 40 ohms. Usually we use 50. Here we're giving you 40 ohms. And we also tell you that assume... Uh, an AM modulation index of 100%. So what does this mean, 100%? Well, it basically means that the modulation index is one. It's just one. It means that the envelopes are touching, like we saw uh, in uh, two slides ago. They're touching. And we give you three questions. What is the value of VM? How do you find the value of VM? That's the first question. The second question, find the uh, power of the carrier find the power of the lower side band, find the power of the upper side band, find the total power, find the bandwidth of the AM signal. So all this is ask and B. In C, we ask you to plot the spectrum of the AM signal. But here we're being nice to you. We just tell you to plot the spectrum as voltages, peak voltages versus frequency, not dBm, not dBm. But then again, if you were to, to find it in dBm, you could just use the equation that we derived. So that, that's not the, a nightmare as well. So you could use it. And in fact, we showed it in the previous uh, numerical example earlier on in, in the slides. So let's, let's do it together. So um, uh, A, find the value of Vn. Well, uh, before we begin, I'm going to just rewrite the information that we found in a nice way. So I'm just uh, uh, rewriting everything. 
uh, in a nice way, and then we could begin. It's it's like when you let's say you want to cook a, a pizza or a cake, you prepare all your ingredients nicely on the table. Uh, all the measurements is done, and then you could do your magic. You could mix and match the stuff and prepare your dough or whatever you're doing. Same thing here. We just prepare all the data that we have nicely, and then we will use this data. So what do we have? We have for the uh, message signal uh, VM, we don't have a value. We have the frequency, it's 3 kilohertz. For the carrier signal, we have the amplitude of 10 volts. And we have the carrier frequency of 550 uh, kilohertz, which is reasonable for AM. We have the modulation index of 100% or 1. And we have a load resistance of uh, 40 ohms. 40 ohms is provided to us. Now we want to find VM. Now, if we go back to the definition of M, the modulation index, the modulation index by definition is equal to this, right? The For a tone, it's equal, and we showed it to you, it's equal to the amplitude of the uh, message signal over the amplitude of the carrier, which is equal to 1, because we're giving it to you. We're telling you it's 100%. It's 1. And what this means is that VM is equal to VC. So your amplitude of the message is equal to the amplitude of the carrier. Do we know the amplitude of the carrier? We do. It's 10 volts peak. So that's what it is, 10 volts. So we got the first one. A is done. We got it. Okay, uh, next, B. B, we want to find PC, PL, PLSB, PUSB, PT, and the bandwidth. But we notice in C that we're also asked to do the spectrum. So maybe it's always a, a good idea to actually draw the spectrum, the spectrum. And then as we draw the spectrum, this will be useful to, to find these ones. I told you anytime we, uh, at least for me, anytime I try to find the power of certain, um, uh, uh, of certain uh, signal, uh, uh, sometimes it is, like we said, it is not a bad idea to use your uh, frequency domain to find it. It's very, it could be helpful. And that's why instead of doing B, I jumped right away to C. So um, let's do C first, and then we'll go back to B. So here we ask you to do the spectrum of the AM signal. It's an uh, AM signal. We know it's going to have uh, three spikes uh, because it's a tone, uh, lower sideband, upper sideband, and the carrier. Lo the carrier is at uh, the frequency FC, so 550 kilohertz. The lower sideband would be the same thing, 550 minus the uh, frequency of the message. So minus 3, 550 minus 3, that's at 547. Uh, the upper side man would be 550 plus 3, so that's 553. All of them are in kilohertz, right? That's why the line has kilohertz. And uh, the value, the, the peak voltage of the carrier is 10 volts. So this is 10 volts. And the uh, peak voltage for the lower side man and the upper side man, it's VM divided by 2. So it is also 10 volts. We determined it. We divide by 2, so that's 5 volts. 5 volt this one, 5 volt the other one. And uh, so now we pretty much have everything. If we ask you to find this, the spectrum in dBm versus frequency, that's easy. You just move from this to uh, dBm, and you could use the equations that we talked about multiple times. But here we don't ask you to do that, so that's fine. So we got uh, A, we got C. What is left is B. Let's, let's go and see how we could do B. So B, we ask you to find PC, the power of the carrier. So for the power of the carrier, we go back to Watt's law. Watt's law tells us that you need uh, to find, because it's a sinusoidal, you cannot use uh, its uh, uh, peak voltage. You need to change it to RMS, which is the DC equivalent of a sinusoidal. Uh, so we need to find the RMS of the, uh, the, the carrier frequency uh, uh, voltage uh, squared divided by the load resistance. The RMS is VC divided by square root of 2 because it's a sinusoidal square divided by the load resistance. We clean up this equation. It becomes VC squared over 2 re uh, re resistance. Uh, and we plug in the value. So V is 10 volts. 2 is 2. The resistance is 40. This is 100. This is 80. 100 divided by 80. That gives us 1.25 watts. So we got that. This is done out of the way. 
Next one, what do we have left? We have, we need to find the uh, total. Well, we need to find the lower side band and the upper side band and then the total. But if you remember, we just uh, showed you that we derived an equation. The equation tells us that we could in fact find the total by the way. The total uh, a power for a tone, if, you're, uh, if your message is a tone and you're using AM modulation, it's equal to PC uh, 1 plus M squared divided by 2. M we have, PC we have, so we could in fact uh, plug it in, plug it in the equation. So PC I could just keep 1 plus 1 squared divided by 2, that's 0.5. 1 plus 0.5, that's 1.5, so 1.5 PC, which is 1.5 times 1.25 watts, and we get a total power for the signal of 1.875 watts. Right. In an evaluation, you might use up to three significant digits, so you might write 1.88 watts, that's fine uh, as well. Okay, so we found this, we found this. The only thing that is left is PLSB and PUSB. How do we find that? Well, we could just use common sense. We know the total. We know this. We could subtract one from the other. We could take this, subtract from this. What is left is the power for these two. We simply divide by two. Part of it will come to this one. Part of it will come to this one. So again, we could go back to definition of total power. Total power through superposition, we know is the power of this one plus the power of this one plus the power of this one. Or we said we could be smart about it and just add this in two times this or two times that. That's why we do this. We have this. We have this. We need to find the uh, the power of the uh, lower side uh, band or the upper side band. It, uh, it's up to you. Whichever, they're the same. So lower side band, upper side band, they're the same. They have the same value, same level. So it's equal to P total minus PC divided by, by two. Plug in the values and we get 0.3125 watts. If we write it in engineering notation and with three significant digits, we could just write 313, roughly, it roughly equals, not necessarily equal, roughly equal, 313 milliwatt. And that's what we got for that. So th that answers uh, all of them. We answered all of them. The only thing left is the bandwidth. What is the bandwidth of the AM signal? Well, you can see it here and from the spectrum. You could, uh, basically it is two times FM, two times this, which is basically six uh, kilohertz. But if you don't want to do that, you could you could do it here. You could do 553 minus 547, and this here is your bandwidth for the AM signal, and it is equal to six uh, kilohertz. Okay, so we do it here for you. At this point, I'd like to show you different AM modulation schemes. Uh, there's a variety uh, uh, of these modulation schemes that exist, and they essentially are, are my, minor variations of each other. Uh, and the reason for doing these minor variations is really in order to, to make the communication more efficient. Uh, efficiency comes in when we spend less power in uh, uh, communicating a signal. And that's that's how uh, efficiency is uh, is ensured. So so let's see how we could uh, make the communication more efficient. So it has terminologies, and I'm going to explain you the terminologies. So there is one terminology that you might end up hearing in AM modulation, and it is known as DSBFC. Um, it's just a, a jargon that stands for double sideband full carrier. In fact, all that we've done so far in this lecture is this. Double sideband, you have a sideband on each. This is one sideband, this is another sideband, both of them, and that's why they're double sideband. And there is a carrier. You see the carrier visibly shown here, and that's what it means. So it's a double sideband, full carrier, and this is basically what we did uh, so far, okay? There is another one uh, that exists, and it is referred to as double sideband suppressed carrier, or DSB. Uh, SC. What it means is it's quite similar to this one, quite similar to this one, right? So the spectrum is very similar to this one. The major difference is that the carrier is not shown. So you cannot see the carrier, right? The carrier, nowhere to be seen. It is not here. So you're not going to spend uh, power transmitting the carrier, right? The carrier is there, right? The carrier is there. It's part of these um, side lobes. Um, uh, sidebands rather, uh, but but it, it's 
there is no specific spike for it. So there, it's not a, a dedicated. Uh, it's not a dedicated component for it, and that's why it says suppressed carrier. And the reason for that is again to to make the communication more efficient. You will be spending less watts uh, setting, uh, dealing with a, a, the carrier component on its own. Okay, the bandwidth doesn't change. The bandwidth for DSBSC and for a typical DSBFC uh, is the same. The bandwidth does not change. It is 2 FM and it is 2 FM here. Okay, so let's see how the system actually looks in such a case for a DSBSC. Uh, the system, well, the way it looks is is like this, and it's really, really just a mixer in this case. Uh, and when we mix, we really multiply. So we just take a an input signal, your your message signal, and you have an oscillator that generates a carrier signal, and you just multiply them together. So you have uh, your your, uh, your your message signal, so VM of T, and you have your uh, um, uh, carrier signal, so VC of T, and you literally just multiply them together. You don't do anything else to it. You don't do a DC offset like we did here. You don't do none of that. Uh, and the result that you get is essentially your DSP FC. So let's just show it to you here. Uh, so we take the message. So let's assume you have a tone. You have a tone. So it's VM and this, and you have your carrier signal. And so I multiply it, I put the, uh, the, the amplitudes together. Uh, so you have your mul message multiplied by the carrier, put the amplitude together, this is what we get. And if we use the trigonomic uh, identity that we showed you before, which is if you have sine A times sine B, it's equal to one over two cosine of A minus B minus cosine of A plus B. I just apply it to this, and this is what we end up getting. We get VM times VC divided by two cosine of um, uh, this, so FC. Uh, so if I, if I instead of writing the, the rate of frequency, FC minus FM minus two pi FC plus FM. And if you look at this, look at this. This is your AM signal under DSBSC suppressed carrier. This is exactly what you have, right? So you have two spikes, one spike, another spike. The minus is we don't care about it, right? It's absolute value, so it goes away. Uh, cosine sine it doesn't matter it will be a spike nonetheless this spike happens as fc minus m this spike happens as fc plus m and the value of the spike is vm times vc divided by two be careful about this it's not just vc divided by two is vm it's not just vm divided by two it's vc times vm divided by two right this one here is just vm divided by two and that's what we get okay Let's show you a third uh, one. Um, so in principle, this should be a more efficient, right? Because this one, you're not spending any watts on, on, on the carrier uh, component by itself. And it should be more efficient, this one. So let's see another one. There is another one which is referred to as single sideband suppressed carrier or SSBSC. So DSBFC, DSBSC, SSBSC. So these are terminologies that people sometimes use. But uh, I assume uh, when you see it for the first time, it, it seems a bit confusing. So that's why we're showing you uh, the, uh, the, the details of it here. So uh, for this one, what it means is, in, so here, all of them, they had double sideband. So double sideband, one sideband, another one, one sideband, another one. Uh, full carrier, the carrier, you have it. Suppressed carrier, the carrier is gone. Here, you still have suppressed carrier. So it's very similar to this one. Carrier is gone, but now instead of using double sideband, you just use one of them. That's why it's called single sideband. So this one here, it's very similar to this with a minor uh, variation, just a minor variation. Instead of sending both uh, 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 sidebands, you just send one of them. And that's smarter, right? Why would you need to send both of them? You could just send one of them and, 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 and that's it, right? So you will... Uh, the, the, the power will jump, right? You don't need to have more than that. Uh, you could replicate the other from, from this one, right? So you don't need to send both of them, right? So it's just, it's just, it's not very smart to send both of them, okay? Uh, and that's what you get. And in here, what is also interesting with SSBSC, suppressed carrier, your bandwidth drops. The bandwidth here becomes smaller. The bandwidth of this one is just FM. The bandwidth of this one is 2 FM. The bandwidth of this one is 2 FM. And like we said in communications, you want to make sure that uh, you use um, uh, less bandwidth so, the, so that you could enable more, uh, more smarter utilization of your channel. 
right? You could have more users, you could have more ch channels, you could have more uh, flexibility there. So uh, having a small bandwidth, this is good. You're using less bandwidth. Uh, it will be more economical as well. Okay, so let's see uh, what, 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 how is it different from this one? So pretty much it's the same architecture. You have basically your signal that you send, your, uh, your VM, you have your uh, oscillator that generates a carrier signal. The only difference is that you use a B BPF, a band pass filter, to filter out one of the bands. If you want, you could keep this one, you could keep the USB and you remove the LSB by a filter, you filter it out, you just put a filter around this one, so you keep it, or you keep a filter around here, so you keep this one and then the other one is gone. You just use a band pass filter. And we talked about band pass filter earlier in this lecture. Okay, and this is what, what gets in the output. So how would the uh, the signal look like? This is how the signal looks like, right? So uh, essentially uh, one of them is gone. So it's either this one or this one. And that's why I put minus or plus because maybe somebody will want to keep the minus FC minus FM, which is this one. So if you have the minus, it's basically you're keeping the LSB. And if somebody has the plus instead of the minus, you're keeping the USB, but not both of them, okay? And the uh, the peak voltage of it is again, VM times VC divided by two, like this one, right? So be careful. The, all of them, they are not quite like this one. This is VM divided by two. Now you have a VC here. So this actually uh, uh, could be, uh, uh, is, is certainly more efficient, right? So in terms of efficiency, this is less efficient because you're sending the carrier. This is more efficient because suddenly the carrier is dropped. This is even more efficient because the carrier is dropped, but also one of the other, the other lobe, the other sideband rather is also dropped, right? So this is even more efficient, but you have to be careful here. Uh, uh, this could be detrimental, right? The VC here, the amplitude of the carrier. This could, in fact, although you're saving because you're not sending the carrier, you're not sending the carrier and the other uh, sideband, but this, this VC, if you have a certain value, it could uh, make your power as high as this one. So you have to be careful what the amplitude of your carrier signal should be. This could harm the efficiency of it, okay? So it's just something to, to remember. So I hope you're, this kind of gives you a sense of the, uh, the different ways uh, that AM modulation is possible. Okay. So uh, as a last uh, slide, I wanted to show you the AMD modulator. Uh, there, there are different architectures for the AMD modulator here. We're trying to keep it simple. And so we only show you this architecture and we'll explain you the steps. Um, as a first, step once the signal is detected at the antenna uh, before doing that uh, one has to tune to the specific channel there are multiple channels like we said um, and you have to tune to the specific channel right? every channel has its own uh, uh, bandwidth so if you're using double uh, side uh, band the bandwidth will be in the channel will be 10 uh, FM, so may, uh, 10 uh, uh, kilohertz. If you're using a single side uh, band, the bandwidth uh, uh, of your uh, voice signal should be uh, 5 um, uh, kilohertz. So uh, the RF uh, filter uh, selects the desired radio band. So you filter all the other uh, bands that you don't want. You just essentially filter the one that you want. So you use a band pass uh, uh, filter. You only take the uh, the one that you want, like this one here. So it only filters this one here, um, and, uh, and and that's what it does. Um, so once the signal is received, of course, the signal that you get at the receiver uh, is an RF signal. And what you have to do is you have to bring it back to baseband. Uh, you have to down convert. So what you do, and we talked about it earlier, is you go uh, through a mixer, a frequency mixer, in a local oscillator. And so the RF signal is goes to a mixer and the local oscillator inside uh, your radio will generate the carrier um, uh, frequency. It's multiplied together. And through this multiplication, you end up getting the uh, uh, your signal in the uh, in the basement or sometimes in the IF, the, uh, the intermediate frequency. And once you have it uh, uh, there in the basement, then you could uh, go ahead through the process of detecting your signal. So as a next uh, uh, step, which, which, you, which we generally do with when you get the signal and you've down converted is that you let it go through an amplifier. 
And specifically, we use something called an LNA, a low noise amplifier, uh, so that the, the signal that you got and that you brought down to the, to the base pad is amplified. Um, because the signal that you will get at the radio will be very, very small. Uh, it will have a very small power and you need to amplify it in order to make sense of, of what the signal is, uh, is trying to, to, to convey. So you amplify it using LNA, a low noise amplifier. Then uh, at that point, then we go into the envelope uh, detection step, right? So we said that uh, you have your AM signal and uh, the useful message is in the envelope of the AM signal and you use a detector or an envelope det detection uh, detector. So it performs an envelope detection to recover the information signal. And this is just a basic way of uh, building a detector. So essentially you just have a, a parallel of a, a capacitor and a resistor. And of course you have your diode there. And that's just the one way of building an envelope detector. Uh, we're not gonna go through the entire explanation of this basic circuit because uh, we're trying to, to keep it at the system level, not at the circuit level. So, um, finally, once detection is done, the envelope detection is done, then before your signal goes to the speaker, uh, it, it is amplified yet again. Uh, and in fact, if you look at different architectures for the um, uh, AM demodulator, the, the radio device, there's multiple steps where you amplify along the way. As you move from one step to another, you amplify. So here we do an audio amplification, uh, and this will help uh, drive your, uh, your speaker. Uh, so that you'll be able to to hear uh, the the signal, the message, the news, the music that you that you are being uh, transmitted. Okay, uh, and uh, and and that's about it. So so if you put it all together, all these different uh, components together as a whole, this is known as your radio device or your radio receiver. Okay, and this allows you to hear something uh, in the uh, in the output. Now, what is uh, perhaps interesting to uh, to mention is that. Um, of course, here uh, we explain it to you for the AM. Uh, and, and in AM, one of the biggest problems that, that you have, but also not only in AM, in AM and FM, uh, and, and in fact, in any wireless uh, communication, whether digital or analog, is all the different detrimental things that happen in the channel. So noise, uh, interference, uh, fading, um, uh, 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 and, 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 and others, distortion, you have all these different things that, 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 that you have to account for. But specifically for AM, what happens is, is that uh, uh, it is more sensitive to, to noise and interference. So for instance, if you look here, um, if you get some, some noise, a noise will happen with a, within, a, let's say, a short duration. A short duration, very high spike, uh, it will have a lot of frequencies, many harmonics. And, you know, when, when you try to detect it, you're trying to detect the envelope, the spike of the noise will be properly detected in, in, your, in what you're trying to hear. So noise will be right away uh, observed. And therefore, AM is, is fine, but it's not the best type of uh, communication. It is highly uh, sensitive to noise and interference. Uh, FM, on the other hand, uh, it's, it, I mean, it, you still have, uh, you know, the impact of noise and interference in it, but it, what, what happens with the FM is mostly it, it will modify the, it will perform like a frequency shift to it. And so at the output, your signal, you will still be able to detect it. And therefore, FM is generally um, um, better in terms of uh, detecting a signal. The quality of it will be certainly better than, uh, than AM. But at the same time, AM has its own advantages. Uh, AM operates at uh, um, uh, a lower frequency, so in the kilohertz uh, and some uh, in in the uh, early uh, megahertz, whereas FM is entirely in the in the megahertz. And because it's a lower frequency, the uh, wavelength of it is very high. And what it means is that it will be able to travel longer distances. Uh, so that's that's an advantage of AM. But at the same time, because the 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 um, the frequency is low, the the um, uh, the, uh, the 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 lambda the um, uh, uh, of it is is large. Uh, th that also means that it will not be able to penetrate in in let's say tunnels, right? So if you drive in a tunnel, your AM signal will not be detect. You won't be able to detect an AM signal uh, nicely when you're driving in your car and you're tuning into a radio. Uh, FM will be will get there uh, much better because the um, uh, the wavelength is 
uh, uh, is smaller. And so it will go into, let's say, tunnels in, in areas that are highly secluded and then the signal cannot travel properly. So there's always pros and cons in both of them. And I just wanted to kind of mention it to you. Okay. That's it. Uh, so just let's keep uh, uh, this in mind that AM is more sensitive to noise uh, and interference. And you can see it right away here. The, uh, the spike of noise it, it, it is directly seen here because of uh, direct influence to the envelope. Thank you for your attention and uh, good luck with your studies.